This program was recorded on Monday, March the 19th, in the year of our Lord, 2018. The opinions expressed by the participants in the following program do not necessarily represent that of this station or its management. From the John DeVita Recording Studio, located in an undisclosed and clandestine location on the great northwest side of our fair city of Chicago, we once again are pleased to be presenting yet another edition of our monthly roundtable panel discussion show, Meet the Chicago Historians. Now, here's the guy who is filling in for the guy who started it all. You introduce yourself. Sorry. Uh, is John going to go first? or uh, Well, I'm sorry. I blew that. That's all right. I blew that. I was going to get to Jack Ryan. Can you edit that out, uh, John? Okay, here we go. Okay, From now. the John DeVita Broadcast Center, welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to another broadcast of Meet the Chicago Historians on the Windy City Hometown Entertainment Network on Monday, March the 19th, the year 2018. Today, the panel will be talking about Chicago communities, neighborhoods, and names. So sit back and enjoy Meet the Chicago Historians. And now to start today's broadcast, here's our announcer, Mr. Richard Lang. And now here's our panel moderator, Tom. Hello, <laughs> everyone. Sorry. There you go. Tom McKenna, Tom McKenna, seated at the golden microphone, filling in today for our moderator, John Ryan. John is a little bit under the weather. The last I heard, he was in the hospital. Hopefully, he's recovering uh, the last I heard, he was improving. So hopefully next month, uh, he will be back seated at the Golden Microphone. But for today, I will do my best to fill in. And as we normally do here, uh, let's start off with some introductions. My name is Tom McKenna, retired Chicago police officer. Uh, to my left. Bill Kugelman, a retired Chicago fire chief and uh, past president of the Fire Museum of Greater Chicago, of which I will uh, uh, tell you a little bit later. And to my left. I'm your announcer, Rich Lang. I've got a background in teaching modern American and European history at the college level. And more recently, thanks to our great mentor and recently deceased uh, panel member Ken Little, I've become very much involved and interested in Chicago history, especially neighborhood history, right up the alley for today's topic. And now to my left. Okay, I'm left. Uh, <laughs> my name is Don Peter. I'm uh, retired from downtown Oak Park, which is a merchant association in Oak Park, and uh, glad to be here. Okay. Uh, as we normally do here, we usually start off the uh, program with uh, speaking a little bit about uh, current events. Mm -hmm. And uh, fortunately, we are loaded with current events here. We have an upcoming election we're probably going to touch on. Uh, we have uh, Hillary is back in the news. Uh, she just will not, see it, will not go away. Uh, we have some... Uh, uh, Chicago politics to talk about. We Everyone is recovering from St. Patrick's Day here. Uh, a huge celebration in the city of Chicago, for those of you that aren't aware. Uh, I know when I was growing up, being uh, Irish-American, I thought that uh, St. Patrick's Day was a holiday. I still think it should be, but that's my humble opinion. Um, let's, let's start. I, I want to just mention Hillary, but no. Hillary Clinton, uh, for those of you that have been living under a rock for the last few years, lost the last presidential election to, to Donald Trump. And she has spent the entire time since she lost trying to figure out why she lost. Recently, Hillary uh, took a trip to India. Uh, she took the opportunity to badmouth the United States of America. And then she, fa she fell down the stairs. I... I, I I know I shouldn't laugh at that. 
It is not funny to laugh at anyone that falls down the stairs. But if you can go on YouTube and, uh, and get the video of Hillary falling down the stairs uh, mm -hmm. two or three times, even af after two people were helping her on the stairs, she fell again. Um, well, let me just say this. If you watch it and you don't laugh, you have absolutely no sense of humor whatsoever. Uh, gubernatorial race. We have uh, the front runners, J.B. Pritzker, a uh, billionaire, and uh, the right behind him, I guess, is Chris Kennedy. I don't think Chris Kennedy is a billionaire. I think his family might be billionaires, but I don't know if Chris got it to the the B. I think he's still in the M uh, millionaire You're right. millionaire class. And uh, so far, their commercials are telling everyone uh, to, to think of them as the common man. Uh, when I think about the common man, I certainly don't think of anyone that's worth a billion dollars. Hmm. And uh, I don't know for what reason. I guess they have political consultants uh, that tell them that it's a good idea. But they somehow think that they're running against Donald Trump. Their commercials are mentioning Donald Trump. I hate to break the news to him, but Donald Trump is president of the United States for at least three more years and maybe four more. So I would say to concentrate uh, on the issues, one of J.B.'s commercials uh, was, uh, he says in a very serious tone of voice that when he was growing up, uh, his mother fell ill uh, and he had to step in to help the family. Uh, when I first heard that commercial, uh, and if you aren't familiar with J.B. Pritzker, you might think that J.B. Pritzker was working uh, at Costco in the, uh, in the stock room and had to give up that job to help his mother that was uh, uh, came, uh, afflicted with a handicap. But when I was watching the commercial, I yelled at the screen and said, J.B., you are a billionaire. What in the name of God did you have to step up and do? You are a billionaire. With a B. Billionaire, with a B. And this, and this is the front runner. Uh, but for the voters of Illinois, I'm certainly not surprised if J.B. wins the election because, let's not forget, uh, we've had three, three governors that have gone to jail in Illinois. Uh, our last governor, who's sitting in jail right now, the voters of Illinois, in their infinite wisdom, elected him twice. So, uh, if uh, history repeats itself, probably uh, J.B. will be the Democratic uh, nominee, and he will be running against... Uh, Re remember that Rauner was not a poor soul either, Tom. Yeah, yeah Ra Rauner's also a, a, multi a multimillionaire. Oh, yeah, big, big money, big money. Well, and and the, the both of the Democratic candidates in their debate couldn't wait to tell the electorate how and why they are going to raise taxes, but they're only going to raise taxes against the rich, mm -hmm. uh, define rich. They're going to have a well, and then a, another candidate wants to tax pensions. Uh, you know, maybe the. Uh, the other way to go would be reducing expenditures. Uh, I think if I ran, I would be telling the, Amer the uh, voters of Illinois that I am not going to raise your taxes. I am going to cut our expenses. You know, I have to laugh when a politician says, uh, Pre Preckwinkle, the uh, Cook County Board is also running again for uh, president of the Cook County Board. When she raised the uh, uh, soft drink tax, uh, she well actually she created uh, the soft drink tax sugar tax sugar yeah. tax and she well the su the sugar free drinks were mm -hmm. also included in that go figure but uh uh there was no alternative no alternative uh that would be the equivalent of walking into your boss and saying hey boss you know i was going over my budget with my wife last night and uh it looks like I really don't have enough money, so the only alternative is for you to give me a raise. Uh, what do you think the boss would respond to that? Uh, find yourself, 
another job or get the hell out of my office. But a politician says with a straight face, there's no, there's no alternative other than to raise taxes. I could, I'd like to go to the board meeting and say, um, excuse me, Madam President, but there is an alternative. Cut spending. She said, uh, well, we're gonna, if, if uh, they repeal the, uh, the soft drink tax, we're going to have to uh, lay off personnel. That's how it works. That's how the system works. You do not create a deficit and then say there's no other alternative but to raise taxes. Uh, you know, what, what we are saying today, and today is the 19th, tomorrow, Tuesday, is the election. Uh, this program won't be on the air until you know, probably Wednesday, Thursday, John, right? And uh, uh, it, it's just going to be very, very interesting to see how this thing turns out. Uh, it's a shame we can't <coughs> uh, change some people's minds, but uh, be a little too late uh, even for voting, uh, uh, what do they call it, premature voting or uh, yeah, early, early voting. Early voting. It's it's too late for that even. So it's going to be interesting to see how this turns out. Well, uh, when when, they, when, a, when a candidate makes the statement that they want people to pay their fair share of taxes, 50% of the people in this country don't pay any federal tax at all. Exactly. That's, that's 50%. I believe 10% pay like 80%. So what? how is that fair? Someone please explain to me. Mm -hmm how a small percentage of people pay the majority of taxes, 50% pay no taxes, and that's fair. Yeah. I mean, I... I You're right, yeah. It's, uh, where is the fairness coming in? It doesn't seem like there's fairness anywhere. Uh, this election has, has been one of history. Uh, it's not what these people are going to do for us or not do for us it's a history of banging the other guy well that's why the, the state of illinois people yeah. are leaving in droves oh yes my uh daughter and son-in-law and their family just moved out to las vegas they uh, they were living i have a place in las vegas they were living in my place and they just bought a place of their own uh, my son-in-law is a carpenter, and he worked for a company that had a, uh, a uh, affiliate in uh, Las Vegas. By moving from Illinois to Nevada, he got a, well, 4.9, let's just say 5% pay raise. 5% hmm. pay raise, just moving out of Illinois. I mean, that's that's unbelievable. You know, when they enacted that last, 4.9%. Uh, if I was a state legislator, I, I would have been looking out the window of the state capitol w waiting for them to start marching with, uh, with the, w the uh, torches and pitchforks mm, yeah. on the capitol. Nothing. Nothing. Just got, took 4.9% of your money. Oh, well. I mean, it's, you know, you talk about a taxpayer revolt. You know, I, I have a, I have a, uh, a thought Rauner uh, made the state of Illinois a sanctuary state, our governor. So he chose to break the law, basically. Uh, yep. Illegal. So, so if it's okay for him to break a law, then I think it's okay for me to select a law that I want to break, and that law would be paying taxes. You know, you can break one law, I'll break a law. Oh, how, how does how does that sound? Same as a manual is done. Sounds like you're going to go to jail. Yeah, right. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. They say these these sanctuary cities. I mean, it it's outrageous. Yes. As as little as twenty years ago, if you would have suggested that to someone, they would have thought you were crazy. Well, I was on, and this happened before I retired. I've been retired about uh, fifteen years now, and I used to tell people about you cannot even ask someone if they are a citizen. Police officer. Right. You cannot ask if they're a citizen. Uh, 
you know, people say, well, when did that start? And I said, well, about uh, 20, 25 years ago. They go, you're kidding me. I said, no. And now Emanuel is going to issue the Chicago ID card that will allow illegals to vote. Isn't that a joke? The reason, the reason for that is, and anyone politician that d denies this, and they, most of them do deny this, is it's all about votes. They don't care if someone is illegal or not. If they can pull the lever or tap the screen now, I guess you would call it, uh, and vote, th they don't care. They want their vote. Mm -hmm. A classic example is when the, uh, it was originally called the Gay Pride Parade Forum. Now it's the Pride Parade. It's not the Gay Pride Parade. There wasn't a politician, I'm talking, what, 30-some years ago, there wasn't a politician that would get in within 10 miles of that parade. Yep. Now they're a voting block. Politicians are lining up, bumping their heads together to get in the front of the parade. I mean, there's no shame. I, I, I said if there was a big enough boil sucker vote and they had a boil sucker parade, every politician would be out there, <laughs> you know, well, I personally don't suck boils, but a lot of my friends are boil suckers. I mean, it's ridiculous. It's and, all, and, it's and all. And it's a big, big money block, too. It's, and it's, it's all about the votes. Yeah. All about the yep. votes. They, rea they realized years ago, especially the Democratic Party, realized that they are not going to get votes from the average American. Um, this last election proved that. Um, so they had to import people to come in and vote. I said the biggest way to stop uh, illegal uh, immigration across the southern border is as soon as they cross, register, register them as Republicans. <laughs> <laughs> the wall, the wall would be built tomorrow. I uh, one of our one of uh, my friends uh, made a made a mention to me about uh, voting tomorrow, and uh, he said that no, he probably wouldn't because he would have to declare, you know, Democrat or Republican. Well, it's it's the, you know, th this is the original vote, and uh, the general vote will be coming up. Uh, a little later, but uh, I, uh, I just, uh, and maybe it's the wrong way to do it, but I love to pick a certain party and then vote against their favorites. That's, that's my way of getting back at them. That's the only way of doing it. Yeah, yeah that's, that's called uh, part, party rating. Yeah. They, they encourage, uh, as a matter of fact, Rush Limbaugh, I think, had a big movement uh, in one, one election to do that. I forget what he called it. But uh, yeah, if you're uh, if you if you uh, don't like a candidate, uh, or, or or rather, if you want to pick the candidate that you want your candidate to run against, who is the weaker of the candidate, weaker of the two, then you take that party's ballot and vote for them because your candidate in the general election will have a better chance of winning. Right. Yeah, it's called par party rating. Oh boy, I'm glad it only comes up every so often. I, I would love to have, you're talking about millionaires and billionaires, I would love to have the money that these guys are spending on postage. The last, right. the last. I've never seen anything like this. But the, the thing about it, as soon as the election's over, they're running again. Right. For the, the next th two or four years. Right. The, the, last statistic, right. the last statistic I heard in JB's uh, campaign, he's spending $180,000 a day. A day. <laughs> mm. um, that's a nice, nice piece of change. And you have to ask yourself, why would someone spend one hundred and eighty thousand dollars a day to get a job that uh, barely, barely pays two hundred thousand dollars? And the answer is they're egotistical maniacs, psychopaths. Uh, you know, they. I saw a list of uh, the uh, top ten occupations for psychopaths. I think. Uh, Politician was was one, a TV uh, anchor man, uh, lawyer, um, all my favorite people. Yes, yeah. You know, talking about uh, early voting. What? A, let's just uh, take a, a small little poll here, and I, I want to hear your thoughts on favorable, not favorable, in the middle. Go ahead, Bill. Start, start us off. Early voting. What do you think? 
early voting. Uh, I suppose it does have uh, advantages, uh, but uh, a lot of people just put it off. Uh, I think this early voting is going to uh, probably show what the final voting is going to be. Uh, no doubt about it. Right, but can they can't count the early votes until election day? Is that correct or not? Yeah, right, right, That's right. They right. know they know how many people vote, but they don't yeah. know who voted. I right. mean, who they voted for. Yeah. Right. They they have good guesses, like oh, yeah. everything else. What do you, What do you think? I've never uh, voted early, mainly because I always wonder in case something turns up at the last minute, right, right. the day or two before the election, to change your mind. Right. Now, there may be a way of overcoming that legally, I don't know, but it would be a process that would take a long time. So, for that reason, I, I tend just to vote on the day of. Yeah, I, originally when they came out with it, I was, you know, a traditionalist and, you know, I'm old school, I'm going to vote on election day mm -hmm. you know of course in the old days you had to vote on election day be to get your uh, your pint of wine from the precinct captain or or two bucks or wh two whatever buck, whatever yeah. you whatever you wanted two bucks as a matter of fact uh when i still lived on the south side my next door neighbor was one of mike madigan's uh top precinct captains and naturally the precinct captain was always in the polling place when you voted so every time i came out of the booth i used to say okay emo where's my pint of wine uh he, after about the third or fourth election, when I walked out, he said, "Don't, don't say it, don't <laughs> say it anymore." Here it is. <laughs> yeah, but, but well, that was the that was the throwback when the precinct captains got everybody out of the, out of the, uh, the uh, tenements on West Madison and, and uh, here go go Flop vote. Votes. Yeah, yeah, right. Here's here's yeah. the, you're going to vote under this name. Do uh, you you uh, and 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 not? Uh, I'm not changing the subject here, but uh, uh, voting in a firehouse uh, and voting in a police station uh, are are a couple of things that I just uh, abhor. Uh, I don't know what it's like to vote mm -hmm. or to to be working in a police station in a district. Uh, but I do know what it's like to be working in a firehouse when these mopes are coming in and, uh, uh, you know, especially a busy house uh, where, where the cook has got uh, a lot of things on the stove and uh, much less just the coffee. And uh, th they aren't doing a damn thing. And they're walking all over the place and, you know, upstairs, downstairs. Uh, when I was president of the union, I tried to stop that, which I did for uh, a little while. And I noticed uh, in the paper uh, yesterday, or was it this morning, uh, that uh, they're back in the firehouses again. Hmm. And, and that's just a damn shame. Uh, you know, no matter what you think, uh, you still have things to do in that firehouse and you don't want a, a bunch of a bunch of, uh, well, for the lack of a better word, strangers walking around mm. and, and then finding out the next night or the next day that things are missing. Uh, yeah, that's yeah, that, that's a good point. I think it's a little bit different for the police stations because they can isolate it off to the side, but most houses, especially the older houses, there's just no room for, you know, for, to... to uh, to handle it properly. Oh no! In the firehouse, there is no place. Yeah, right. You know, but but yes, in the police, I was in sixteen the other day. Yeah, especially the new, voting. especially the new sta stations. All, all, was all, as a matter of fact, I think all of the new uh, police facilities in Chicago have a community uh, room. Me meeting room right. that they can hold it in there, and they, they basically it's even got a separate en entrance, so that wouldn't interfere with yeah. any of the uh, police duties. But in the firehouse, you're right; it's uh, it, it, it's different, especially in the old, some of the older houses. Oh yeah, it's it's uh, even in the new ones, it, it just isn't the right thing to do. Uh, and I can't see, you know, what what are they saving? I mean, is the idea to save money? No, not saving any money, doing that. But one uh, memory I have when I was a kid, going with my parents to vote, and they would invariably vote on private property. The basement of right. a neighbor, neighbor, yeah, 
And uh, you don't seem to hear much of that at all anymore. No. It's no. churches, schools, and the occasional police and fire station. Right, right. And everything has to be handicap accessible, which I, it's, well, that's gr- a, it's great. But That's a big thing about private homes, you know, right. basements. Right. Well, even churches sometimes. True, true. Well, you know, talking about voting, one of my favorite voting stories, and, and he tells this story himself, so I f- feel free to tell it here. Ed Burke, the... Mm. I don't know, is he, is he the longest uh, member of the city council? Or oh, sure. Yes, he, uh, sure. He that, I believe, yeah. uh, 14th Ward. Uh, Eddie tells a story. He was in the state of Indiana, and he ran into a former constituent, an old, older woman, and she told him, she said, Ed, when I, get mi- when I die, please bury me in Chicago because I want to stay active in politics. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good line. That's right. <laughs> but, you know, another d- d- very discouraging thing about t- elections is how few people vote. And when they when they give the statistic, they don't give the statistic on uh, eligible voters, which is much higher than they give the s- statistic on registered voters. And, I mean, it, it's, I mean, it's really terrible. The, uh, um, p- I guess people don't, they just don't care. You know, I saw one of the best things I saw was in the newspaper, one of the first elections that I voted in, and it said, today, do something that the majority of the people on the face of the earth only wish they could do, vote. I mean, the amount of countries, democratic countries, I mean, are few and far between. Yep. And and then I had a laugh, uh, uh, Putin got reelected in Russia. What, hmm. what, a, what a surprise. <laughs> God, I can't believe it. I, I, what happened to the yeah, people that and uh, and by, went against them? Yeah, by, <laughs> by I think a 70% margin of overwhelming. <laughs> I don't know who was running against them. Maybe, maybe I, Hillary ran in. Uh, I think a lot of that is not kids, but younger voters that they're the only ones they've had a chance to vote for. You know, 17, 18 years what is eighteen years is the uh, right? But I mean, voting age. Some of there was an article in the Tribune saying that a lot of the younger voters in Russia don't know anybody else to vote for. That they're the only ones they know of because he's been running. Governor, oh. the 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 president runs the government. The government runs the media. Right. So, guess who's not going to be allowed in the media? <laughs> well, that's why right. I, I still have to laugh about the uh, the Russian interf- influence in the election uh, investigation that's been going on for here over a year, right? Yeah. They still haven't come up come up with anything. But I know personally, uh, I was involved because I was planning on voting for Hillary, and I got a phone call that said, "This is Ivan." You would vote for Trump, so that swayed that swayed my vote. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, are you kidding me? You know, I, the Russian in, influence. What what about the the uh, uh, United States mainstream media influence in the election? They had they did every possible thing to sway the American voter to vote for Hillary. Yeah, and and it failed. That's right. I mean, th- plus their predictions. I had a laugh. I was watching one of the shows Sunday, I forget which one, and they were asking the experts again to talk about the midterm elections. These are the same experts that said uh, Trump would be lucky, lucky to win three states. The New York Times, I, I believe on election day, said that Hillary had a night, was it a 90% chance of winning? Not only were they yeah. wrong, they were Very so far wrong, it was a joke. Yeah. Every single thing down the line, and these were the experts, and then they keep on asking someone. I mean, you know, if if I consulted a financial consultant and he put me into bankruptcy, I don't think I'd be asking him again. <laughs> uh, th- I, I remember it distinctly. There was one expert, again, this is uh, prior to Trump getting the nomination, and he had a, uh, a blue screen behind him with statistics. He had... He had uh, pointers, he had a clipboard, and he was telling us, this is before the Republican National Convention, he was telling us that there was no p- 
possible way <laughs> that Donald Trump could win on the first ballot at the Republican convention. It was abso- statistically absolutely impossible. And he showed, you know, with statistics and graphs in this state and the electoral voters in this state, and guess what? He was 100% wrong. <laughs> and these are the experts that I, oh. they are now consulting about the midterm election. And I hope what th- I hope they're as wrong as they were <laughs> this time as they were last time. And, and that's one reason, too, uh, uh, Tom, that I, I think this age of 18 is uh, too far uh, too far out. It's, it should be, uh, th- they don't know. Oh, pardon me, Bill. Pardon me, gentlemen. It's time for our first intermission. Let's break. You've been listening to Meet the Chicago Historians, and we thank you for it. We'll be right back. Hello, friends. Do you need new tires for your vehicle? How are the brakes? Are they in good condition? How's your front wheel alignment? Do you need your tires rotated? How are the shocks and struts? Do you need an oil and grease change? How about a tune-up? When was the last time you had your engine tuned up? How about the wiper blades? Are they nice, sharp blades to clean off the rain and snow? How are the headlights, tail lights, stop lights, turn directional signals? Are all the bulbs working? How's your cooling system and the exhaust system? How about your battery? Does that need to be upgraded? How about the belts and hoses? fuel injectors, timing belt and chain, and air conditioning. Is that all working properly? Well, if you need any maintenance work done on your vehicle, go to Grand Tire and Auto Service, which is located at 7034 West Grand Avenue in Chicago. They are on Grand Avenue on the north side of the street, about two blocks east of Harlem Avenue. You can't miss the building. There's a big Goodyear sign right on top of the building. Or you can call area code 773-622-4361. Don, Chris, or Ken will be more than happy to assist you and to help you with any questions you might have about the maintenance on your vehicle. Their hours are Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday from 7.30 in the morning until 7 p.m. in the evening. On Saturdays from 7.30 in the morning until 4 o'clock in the evening. Sundays from 9.30 until 3. So once again, for any maintenance work you might need on your vehicle, go to Grand Tire and Auto Supply. Once again, their address is at 703. 34 West Grand Avenue in Chicago, about two blocks east of Harlem Avenue on the north side of the street. And their phone number is area code 773-622-4361. They have great service. Their mechanics are all certified mechanics, and they do quality work. Now, I've been going to Grand Tire with my vehicle since 1985, right up until this present day. So once again, Grand Tire and Auto Service at 7034 West Grand Avenue in Chicago. Their phone number is 773-622-4361. Don, Chris, and Ken will be more than happy to help you and to advise you on any maintenance work you might need on your vehicle. So once again, Grand Tire and Auto Service at 7034 Grand Avenue in Chicago, about two blocks east of Harlem Avenue on the north side of the street. You can't miss the building because there's a big Goodyear sign on the top of the building. That's Grand Tire and Auto Service. 
7034 Grand Avenue in Chicago, and their phone number is area code 773-622-4361. For quality service, it's Grand Tire Auto Service, 7034 Grand Avenue in Chicago, 773-622-4361. You will be completely satisfied with the work that they do. Now back to our special pre-primary election edition of Meet the Chicago Historians. Tom? Okay, welcome back. Uh, we're still on the topic of uh, politics, elections. Uh, one thing that just came to mind, my wife, my wife brought it up yesterday. Uh, Hillary, in the many, many, many many excuses that Hillary is using of why she didn't get elected other than the obvious she was a poor candidate and uh, and didn't run a good campaign but other than the obvious she's trying to figure out how she lost in her latest and you gotta love this she said that white women voted for Trump because their husbands told them to vote for Trump uh, obviously they don't know my wife uh, because if my wife voted for Trump because I told her to vote for Trump, that the first time she lis listened to me in 25 years of marriage. Uh, also, isn't that a bit insulting to women? I mean, isn't she so supposed to be so pro-female well, and women? She, I heard this morning that she backed down on that. Uh, she didn't realize that it would create such a furor among the women, and so she backed down. But just as the election, it's too late. Oh yeah, too late. Yeah, she she mm -hmm. named every every conceivable person and and uh, 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 scheme, other than the obvious. It's you know I I use this term a lot, and it is one of my favorite terms. And it I learned it at uh, one of my professors at DePaul. He used to use it all the time, and it's genius is the ability to detect the obvious. And for those of you that don't understand that, I'll give <laughs> a very quick, <laughs> quick uh, explanation. Two guys go in to buy a horse. They each buy a horse. So they're looking at their new horses, and they're going to store them, uh, board them in the same stable. So the one guy says, uh, well, you know, if our horses are in the same stable, how are we going to be able to tell them apart? And the one guy says, well, I'll cut the tail off my horse, and then my horse will be the one with the short tail. Whoops. And the other guy says, well, that's not going to work because the tail will grow back and we won't be able to. He says, uh, well, I'll cut the mane off my horse. And uh, that way my horse will be the one with the short mane. And they said, oh, no, we can't do that because it'll grow back. So there's a guy from the stable watching them. And he said, well, why don't you just do this? Yours will be the white horse and yours will be the black horse. <laughs> Now, that's the ex explanation of genius is the ability to detect the obvious. And obviously, Hillary is not a genius because the obvious is why she lost and she just can't, she can't accept responsibility for no. it. You know, they, they, oh. they say in the, in the waning days of the election, the only person in her, in her uh, campaign staff that saw what was happening was Bill Clinton. He said, you know, these state, these Midwestern states looks like they're going to have a high voter turnout and it looks like they're going for Trump and they ignored him and that's exactly what happened you know the the uh, the New York uh, uh, Manhattan people and the uh, the West Coast Los Angeles uh, West Hollywood people they just never saw it coming because they have they have, they have lost touch I mean with with the American people they are so far out of touch what the average American thinks that w and this this election proves it there were two female commentators on some television station in uh, New York Manhattan uh, the day after the election and one said you know I, I can't believe this because I don't know anyone that voted for Trump and that's probably true they don't I said I'd, I'd like to run a, uh, a bus trip you get one from Manhattan or maybe a couple bus loads from Manhattan and maybe a couple, couple bus loads, maybe one from San Francisco, Nancy Pelosi's district, and get maybe one from L.A., Hollywood, West Hollywood. 
and drive them to, you know, South Dakota, you know, or uh, or uh, uh, Upper Wisconsin, the Upper Peninsula in Michigan, uh, and take them, drop them off at, let's say, a uh, a Boy Scout uh, or a Cub Scout Blue and Gold dinner or a pancake bref- breakfast in some church, and say, get in there and talk to these people and find out what the American people are really thinking because you people are so far out of touch, and if you don't think you are, just look at the results of the last election. They, 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 they have no conception. Again, it's with the, uh, it's with the uh, gun, uh, the uh, gun control people. Um, the gun violence. Uh, here's my th- thoughts on gun violence. If guns were violent, uh, and as we all know, they are inanimate objects. If guns were violent then the area in the United States that had the most guns would be the most violent. I mean, it just goes. It's kind of common sense. Well, per capita gun ownership in the United States is the highest in the state of Wyoming. Almost everybody's got a gun there. Yep. There's no violence. So here's the thing. Wyoming has all the nonviolent guns, and Chicago has all the violent guns. So we, sh- we should take the places. we should right we should take the violent guns <laughs> from Chicago and give them to the people in Wyoming, and take their nonviolent guns and give them to the uh, people in Chicago, and that would of course solve the problem, right? And right. the deaths would go down right. because yeah, I, right. I because, think there's more people in Chicago than there is I in check, Wyoming. Yeah. I, I, Probably, yeah. I store <laughs> I store my guns in an area in my house. It's up in the bedroom on the upper shelf. They're locked up. And uh, every day I look at the guns to see if they have gone out and committed a violent act. <laughs> and so far, they haven't. So I guess I'm, the, I'm one of the lucky people that has not nonviolent guns. I, I, uh, that's a good idea, Tom. Uh, I think I may put one of those, uh, like I have on the dog, you know, those, one of those chips so I know where... Right. Uh, where to find the guns? Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, because I mean, I you know, if uh. you, yeah, if, uh, you know, one day I might look up on my shelf and uh, see there's a uh, an empty uh, Slurpee cup, and you know, find out that one of my guns went out and stuck up a Seven Eleven. There you go. It, it's. I mean, it, it, uh. I, I know it's it's ridiculous, but it 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 makes a point. It does. That it it's shows not, what it yeah, is. It's not gun violence. It's 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 <laughs> people violence. Right. Yeah. I had a neighbor next door, and we used to get in about guns. I said, just for the heck of it, if all the guns were taken away and people started using rocks as weapons of choice, would we would we have to ban and get rid of rocks? He said, sure. Okay. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, that's that's the thing. If, if, if this was utopia or someone could w- wave a magic wand and eliminate the world of guns from the world, well, maybe that might not be a bad idea, you know, but that's not going to happen. And, and uh, um, the st- our, again, our state legislature uh, enacted uh, a law, uh, people under, I think under 21, they can't have magazines uh, with more, I think, uh, 10, t- ten, ten, ra- ten, ten rounds. rounds. So what they did in effect is they made, they t- and, and there's no grandfather clause in this, so what they did in effect is they turned law-abiding young people that owned extended <laughs> magazines uh, with the, uh, the signing of the bill, they turned them into criminals. Oh. And plus, yeah. if you think, if they think for one second that any of these gangbangers are going to say, I mean, I can just see a bunch <laughs> of uh, Latin <laughs> disciples mm. standing around, hey, hey, Paco. They just enacted that extended uh, magazine. Co- oh, no, we got to turn our guns in now. No, no, just the magazines. <laughs> oh, yeah, well, yeah. Uh, we'll, 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 we'll send someone down to the police station to turn them in for... Are you kidding me? <laughs> I mean, are they that naive that they think that will actually happen? Plus, obviously, it's not happening because no one's mentioning... I, I don't think there's been one person that turned in an extended magazine. And the thing is... Uh, the majority of semi-automatics, well, I don't know, I, 
I won't go out on a limb and say majority, but I do believe it's a majority, that they are designed to carry magazines. I mean, the Glock 19 that I had in uh, the job, it's uh, fif- 15... 15 rounds, you know, fif- 16 rounds, fif- 15, 15 and 15 one. rounds. It's, it's yeah. designed to, to handle that. I mean, and that's, that's why you buy them. You know, another thing that drives me crazy... <coughs> Going back to Hillary for a moment, uh, (laughs) with all of her traveling and speaking, can we say with certainty that she is out of politics? Uh, No. Yeah. I I, I can't say with certainty because if she's not, if if she if she's not dropped out of sight yet, we may we may see her return. There may be a Senate seat in Illinois that might welcome her someday. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Equaling her New York Senate (laughs) service. This is possible. Yeah, she but sure she's snuck uh, in there too. Seventy now. Talking bit. about politicians, and the, and again, if the media is on your side, you get away with anything. When she was running for uh, senator in New York, she had on a Yankees hat, and someone said, and I'm surprised that they actually said it, but they said, uh, "Hillary, weren't you? Or did, didn't you say you were a lifelong Cub fan?" And she said, "I kid you not." She said, "Well, yes." Uh, I w- uh, was a lifelong Cub fan, but secretly, I was a Yankee fan. Yep. I remember Secret- that. Yeah. Secretly. Yeah. So that means she wore her Cub stuff, and then when she went home, she opened up the closet, and she had Mickey Mantle's jersey in there, and Yogi Berra in the New York. I mean, are you kidding me? As they, as they say in the ghetto, you tell that story to a mule, and it'll kick you. I mean, really. And they just let her get away with it. Yeah, she, she said that, I mean, you could go... You could have a whole program about stuff that Hillary said that was complete and total nonsense. Actually, outright lies. I mean, the time she landed and she was under fire, oh, yeah. and then they showed the tape, and there's a little girl giving her flowers. She said she was named after uh, Hillary, uh, Sir Edmund Hillary. Uh, yeah. Yeah, he, when she was born, he, he wasn't had, even there. Yeah, he had, yeah. To, we had been, <laughs> I mean, it's just. Poor timing there. Yeah. It's, uh. Well, look at her. She had, a, had to put up with Bill with his indiscretions, and uh, so she uh, must have uh, really had that in the back of her head where she, you know, she felt that that's the way she should act. Yeah. Strange. The bad thing about lies is, one, you got to remember them. Yep. And yeah. two, if you say the same thing long enough, people are going to believe you. Yeah. And you may believe it yourself. If you say it long <laughs> oh, enough. yeah. 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 Yeah, well, look at Hillary thinks she was a great candidate. <laughs> I mean, how, how many how many th- th- things can you blame? And th- this is unprecedented because the a candidate that lost usually just goes away, or if, if there's a senator, they go back to the Senate. Mm-hmm. But they shut up about it. I mean, Hillary hasn't shut up about this, and I mean, the, 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 there's a, a list of reasons that she says why she lost, and again. Going back to one of my favorite lines, genius is the ability to detect the obvious. Obviously, she cannot detect the obvious of why she lost. <laughs> Strange. Oh, boy. Maybe she and Hillary will, Bill, Hillary and Bill will someday really be pushing Chelsea into political office. And Th- trying to there's master talk this. about that. Yeah. yeah, there's talk about that. Yeah, yeah, there, yeah there's talk uh, yeah. about, um, uh, let's see, uh, the 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 liberals' dream candidates, uh, Oprah Winfrey. Yeah, uh, yeah, they chose. She'd make a great president. Um, Michelle uh, Michelle Obama. Uh, yeah, that's a, that's another uh, uh, wish list for the liberals to get get into politics. Uh, mm-hmm. uh, all the uh, celebrities that are the um, the uh, movie stars, Sean Penn and. Uh, uh, George the Rock. Jo- George Cooney and uh, The Rock. Here's here's my thing about <laughs> about movie movie stars. You show up to work. They give you the clothes that you're going to wear. They put makeup on you to make you look better than you actually looked. You know, whole world of make believe. They give you the lines that you're going to read. Someone else photographs you. Someone else record you and this gives you the right to speak about police procedures but we can't forget about ronald reagan uh, yeah right yeah. Yeah. and that's uh, the reason that some of those people got in there because ronald reagan was you know 
a, a good president. Right. I think he was one of the best yeah. at his time. You know, he exactly. really got in there. So the rest of the Hollywood crowd, oh, why not me? Okay, okay. Uh, do we have a uh, mystery guest on the line? Oh, ho hold on. Let me put my uh, earphones in. Doesn't matter. Is uh, Hello. Yeah. Can Can you hear Can you hear us, Jen? Hello. Okay. I guess we don't have a. Uh, Jack, can you hear us? <coughs> Hello, Jack. Oh, we're here. <coughs> Whoops. Jack, are you there? Well, maybe maybe we won't have don't have a mystery guest on the line. Maybe a maybe a politician got to us. Yeah, that's right. We've been uh, we've been censored by the. Uh, <laughs> they don't they don't like our remarks about the media. Of course, I guess doing a radio uh, program makes us part of the media, so we're criticizing ourselves, folks. That uh, that uh, telephone call that we can't get through was our uh, leader, uh, Jack Red Ryan, calling. And uh, are you on the uh, air now, Jack? Hey, come on, I'm trying to faint. I can hear you guys this time, though. There we go. Oh, there all there right. Are. Okay. I, didn't, I, didn't, I didn't cuss on here. Did I? I mean, chance. What's that? I didn't cuss while I was on the... Uh, uh, I hope not. <laughs> Candace phone. Oh, that, that sounds better. Okay, so, for, hey, Jan, first of all, how you feeling? Oh, better than I did, yeah. If you told me a week ago that I wouldn't be able to come in there, I would have said you're a liar, but, you know. Hmm. So. So, so are you in or out? I'm back home now, yeah. Oh, all right. Oh, okay. Well, then, wh well, then why aren't you here? <laughs> That's not, hey, no excuses. You know, this is severely going to reflect on your pay. Yeah, I know. It's a, I was going to force it. I'm probably going to draw a suspension for this, right? Kate, Kate misses you so much, Jack. Yeah. Oh, is Kate there? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Well, as long as Kate tells you, all right. <laughs> she misses well, anyway, you. Uh, I, I, I just had a question. Maybe somebody knows a shit called the area. McCarthy Road is 123rd Street, I think, too. Isn't it? What's that? McCarthy Road. Is that also oh, oh, yeah, right, right. Is that named after Jenny McCarthy? Uh. No, it, it's named after the former uh, police superintendent McCarthy. Oh, and again, yeah. it's it's. I'm glad you brought that up because we are in the middle of a discussion about politics, uh -huh. and the uh, former superintendent supposedly this week is going to throw his hat in the ring of the uh, mayoral election. He's been talking about it. Right yeah. Now. Well, well, I I guess it's going to be a pretty much done deal. Yeah. Uh, that should that should that should be very interesting. It sounds like it. Yeah. yeah. It should be interesting because. Uh, you know, for an established, uh, endorsed machine candidate, uh, Emmanuel really had a tough time with uh, Chewy Garcia last time around, you know? Well, it, he's he's hoping to get the black vote because he's going to run on a campaign of, hey, most Chicago policemen don't like me, <laughs> so so I, I should so, so I should be great with the black community. <laughs> <laughs> that, sounds, that sounds good. Yeah, right. Okay. Yeah, hey. By the way, sir. What's that? Go ahead. No. Uh, yeah, well, I'm, I'm glad you weren't here because uh, we have been uh, uh, making some very negative comments about your girl, uh, Hillary. Oh, yeah. I know you were a very big uh, Hillary supporter. But what oh, did you ever do with that, that big Hillary yeah. lawn sign you had? Is that is that in your garage for when she runs again? <laughs> I, like I, I see back in, uh, she's in India, she said. Yeah, we, yeah we, already, we already talked about that. Yeah, she, she tailor makes your talk for somewhere. Hmm. Uh, he doesn't want uh, blacks. He doesn't want when Indian Americans. Of course, she didn't say what's tried, did she? Yeah, and then and then she took a took a header down the stairs. <laughs> the, uh, yeah. I, w I again, I said we shouldn't be laughing at that, but if you watch the video, you can't. You basically can't help yourself. She has uh, big problems in staying on her feet. Yeah. Well. Uh, she uh, took that, one of those videos they had where she lost control, her eyes were spinning out of control, and it is, you know, there's something wrong there for sure, I mean, I mean, aside from politically. Yeah, that, that one uh, during the during the campaign when she uh, she fell out, as they say in the black community, yeah. uh, and then they, they, dra 
they dragged her into the limo. I guess she lost a shoe. Yeah. And then when she recovered, they staged that uh, her re-entrance. It, yeah. Uh, we, it, it, we, they we they had a little right. a little girl out there mm -hmm. that uh, she ran up to her and hugged her. Uh, yeah. That was that was all staged. So mm -hmm. I got news for you. Having worked presidential uh, details uh, many many times, the Secret yeah. Service is not going to let anyone run up to a presidential candidate or former first lady and grab them. <laughs> that, the, that whole thing was staged just to show, not one, that Hillary is still fine, there's nothing wrong with her, and right. two, that uh, children love her. You know, yeah. all, they needed, all they needed there was for someone to say, pay no attention to the man behind the curtain. <laughs> I mean, what, what a farce. Yeah. Ch children love her, and uh, I suppose, does that count all of the murdered unborn? Everybody's talking about this abortion on demand. Jack, uh, uh, on your subject, uh, did they take care of your problem? I think more or less, yeah. Okay. Uh, which one, though? <laughs> so, what do you have to do? Rest? We're for rest and watch TV a lot? Uh, yeah. <laughs> we're we're only we're only addressing your physical problems, your mental <laughs> problems. <laughs> have, uh, I, I don't think we don't right. have time. Right, yeah, right. there's another uh, show. <laughs> we'll ha we'll get a we'll get a team of psychiatrists and psych <laughs> psychologists to come in and uh, and give you a thorough thorough examination. Yeah, maybe uh, maybe uh, next week. <laughs> I think maybe we. Uh, I think maybe maybe we should get Sister Jean in. From uh, Loyola, she seems to do a lot of uh, good things for the Ramblers. Oh yeah. Oh yeah, that's right. We I, I was going to mention that we we neglected to mention uh, congratulations to the uh, Loyola mm. Ramblers. Exactly. Sweet, sweet sixteen of the NCAA. Yeah. And and I wonder if yet it is uh, uh, what is it about one o'clock here now? Uh, a certain uh, newsman from uh, where was he from Indiana or? Tennessee, whoever they played, uh, used uh, the word, uh, uh, and I won't use it, but he said, uh, F, uh, Sister Jean. And uh, they're waiting now for uh, his uh, demise. They're yeah. waiting for him to get fired, so... Well that, that well that wasn't uh, wasn't that uh, great, uh, that, 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 that great that's thing to say? That, that certainly was inappropriate. Yeah. Yeah, they, might, they might have misunderstood that. They, he might have might have said famous. Well, I don't know. Yeah, <laughs> unlikely. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Not the tone of his voice, I guess. <laughs> well, I, I t but I tell you that this Loyola win, uh, really, because it, it, the Chicago sports scene has been so dismal, uh, uh, especially this year. I mean, the Hawks aren't in the playoffs. Oh. The, the Bears were a disaster. Bulls are not in the playoffs, so this is uh, this is what uh, exactly what the uh, sports community in the city of Chicago needed to rally rally around the uh, Loyola Ramblers, and I, I, I'm I'm thrilled. I, I oh, went to I, yeah. I went to DePaul, but I know a lot of guys that uh, uh, actually I went to DePaul when they actually had good basketball teams, and uh, no, I'm thrilled. Uh, I hope uh, I hope uh, 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 well I don't want to jinx them, but I mm. hope they I, I hope they move. Do they better. They move on. Yeah. Yeah. yeah what keep was moving. That, um, what year was that when uh, Loyola won on all the years? Sixty. They won it in '63. Yeah. The uh, and uh, uh, a, a member of uh, an alumni of the uh, St. Rita, which John and I both are, Jack Egan, was the starting guard uh, mm -hmm. on that team. His father was a police officer. Oh. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Um, the father, uh, Bill, used to get the detail of the. Part of the Jim, do you remember that? Yeah. Yeah, uh, the. Uh, yeah, it, and it Jack. Do you remember that? What's that? Bud Egan? Well, Jack, Jack Egan, again, the starting guard on the national championship team, uh, he uh, went to law school, became an attorney, and then worked for the state's, attorney office, state's attorney's office, and he was in uh, felony court. Okay. And this is a, a, another one of my favorite. Uh, uh, lines is don't judge a book by its cover when i was in court i used to tell people i said do you see the state's attorney i said do you know that guy started on the loyola national championship team he he was listed in the program as five nine i don't think he was five eight and he gained some weight he was always 
chunky, like stocky, uh, but he gained some weight, and people people didn't believe me. And of course, this was be long before cell phones and Google, where you could tell somebody Google it. But I say, yeah, look yeah. look it up. I said he was a starting guard in the national championship, uh, Loyola, Loyola Ramblers. That was in 1963. And then they had pretty yeah. good teams for the next few years, and then they kind of fizzled out. And the right. and DePaul DePaul had great teams in the. Uh, that was when the NIT was the big tournament. What's that? The NIT National Invitational. Yeah, right. Was a big one. Yeah. You know the the, the stadium that the Loyola Ramblers uh, uh, playing up up on Sheridan Road. Uh, the former boss, my former boss Joe Gentile, he built that stadium over yeah, there. Yeah, right. Yeah, I was going to mention that he yes, was very active. Yes, and. He built uh, Many, many times when I was with Joe, because I was with Joe and I ran his radio station, WJJG, for ten and a half years, every time Joe wanted to go to uh, to the game at Loyola, uh, Oscar and I, we would get in, in his car and drive him down to Loyola, take him to the games, and then we'd bring him back to the, to the studios in uh, Berkeley and uh, get in the truck and come back home again. Jack, can you stick with us for a couple minutes? Yeah, we've, we've, well. we've got to take a station break, uh, Jack. Okay, go ahead. I'll it's time for another brief intermission. You're listening to Meet the Chicago Historians. Uh, off the subject. Hello friends, are you looking for a place to have some printing done? Well I have the right place for you to go and that is the printing store in Oak Park, Illinois. Call or see Phil Berry at 621 Madison Street or call 708-383-3638. Phil Berry will sit down with you and help you plan whatever you need printed. Now his products are brochures, booklets, business cards, catalogs, envelopes, letterheads, flyers, invitations, newsletters, notepads, menus, mailers, manuals, labels, posters, postcards, price list, NCR forms, sale sheets, table tents, pocket folders, and presentation forms. And he also has one to four color offset printing, digital copying, high speed copying, graphic designs, typesetting, laminating, foil stamping, die cutting, and imprinting. And his complete binary service com includes booklets, cutting, scoring, folding, numbering, padding, and drilling. So once again, for all your printing needs, call or see Phil Berry at the printing store at 621 Madison Street in Oak Park, Illinois, or call 708-383-3638. They are located at Madison Street and Clarence, just east of Oak Park Avenue. And that's at 621 Madison Street in Oak Park, Illinois. Or give Phil Berry a call at 708-383-3638. For all your printing needs, the printing store was there to help you. There are 621 Madison Street in Oak Park, Illinois. And once again, you can call Phil Berry at 708-383-3638. Now back to our show. Tom? Okay, John, are you still on the line? Yes, he is. Okay. You didn't, hey, John, you didn't fall asleep, did you? No, no, no. Okay. Thank, thank God for that. You can't beat those five-minute naps. So the uh, so the prognosis is good. You're going to be back jogging and yeah, yeah, uh, and, uh, 
you yeah, uh, they, they want to get me into a uh, physical program, uh, and I, mean, I didn't qualify can, actually uh, when they tested, you know, the, the uh, head of the uh, phys ed, is it physical, physical, ed, phys ed department. You, know, you can you, you can start running some five Ks with me. Okay. I still, you can start running some five K races. Oh, I could drive and run. La last year, I, I I still run. Last year, I ran. Ran yep. one. My wife said to me, "Are you going to run in that?" I said, "Come on, honey. How many guys my age do you know that can run a 5K?" Mm -hmm. She said, "I don't know many guys your age. Period." <laughs> <laughs> was 5K is that about three miles? Is it? Uh, 5K is 3.1. Yeah. 10K is. Uh, I don't know about now, but three well, miles. Well, yeah, hey, 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 John. Getting benefit from running, supposedly. John. Uh, I uh, and I'm going to use another my favorite line again. Don't judge a book by its cover. John, yeah. John and I were on the track team and cross country yeah. team together at St. Rita. Cross country, right? I think we can fix you up. Uh, uh, you can run as a pair, uh, Jack. Uh, uh, you and Phil Klein. <laughs> Very funny. <laughs> Very funny, Twiggy. <laughs> anyway, I. Uh, I'm 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 glad you called in so we c so we uh, can insult you. <laughs> on the air, yeah. We, so <laughs> we can insult you on the air. <laughs> it's no fun. Four, it's like no fun know. insulting you when we're off the air. Yeah. In our in our high school paper, they put down how to score a meet. If the first St. Rita runner came in twenty fifth, remember that time? Oh yeah. <laughs> and the <laughs> and the cross. Simple. Cross country team. That's when it's one of the things. Like in golf, the low score wins. Yeah. Because, uh, yeah, we were uh, we were we had a pretty good team. Yeah. Uh, it was the first year they had it too. Yeah. Uh, oh well. I'll tell you one thing. I mean, I've been a great runner, but I sure came out in physical great physical condition after that. Yeah. Yeah. We were. We we were in we, we we walk home from the park then, which is really yeah. We say we Rita, like we Raynell, the, you know. the cross country team used to practice at Marquette Park. So when we got through at sixty third and Western, well, we from sixty third and Western, we used to walk or run over to Marquette Park, yeah. and then we'd run run back to Rita, and then we'd walk home. We lived, uh, we well John lived closer to Rita than I did, but yeah, I mean we cool. were, we, we were like marathon runners, and then we would go to boys club at night and play basketball. Well, we, got, we, uh, well, we got me wore out now. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Yeah. That's right. Bill, B Bill, Bill is uh, is uh, out of breath just listening to us. <laughs> oh, so am I. I had to, had to sit down. I got all the go away. Anyway. Oh uh, well. So, uh, what do you think of this election, Jack? Oh yeah, that's right. <laughs> I, I think it's the screwiest uh, primary season I ever. I can remember. We were we oh, were just talking back on everybody else and uh, which is uncommon, but they're making no sense about it, you know. But we the one uh, one of the commercials uh, the ads about uh, our congressman Bill Lipinski out in Southwest. Uh, his um, uh, he's uh, he's anti abortion. He's uh, he's uh, he's co cooperated. He's voted on this many uh, different. Uh, well, you know, these are positives. Most people are away. They're making. Uh, you're you're still in uh, Lipinski's uh, congressional district, right? Yeah, yeah. They're making a big move on him. He's a uh, uh, conservative uh, uh, Democrat. Mm -hmm. uh, they're and I think they're making a mistake because that's still a pretty conservative district, and they're bad mouthing yeah. him because he's uh, he's yeah, pro he's pro, it, he's, are, pro yeah. he's pro life and uh, yeah. pro Second Amendment. Uh, that I think that's going to backfire on him. Yeah, I was yeah. I was in I was in his uh, congressional district. I worked with his dad at the park district when I was in high school. I was a day camp counselor, and his uh, father, who, f who preceded him in that congressional district, he was the uh, the uh, director of Marquette Park. Uh, eventually, uh, but I went from Dan Lipinski to Jan Chakowski. That's like going from uh, Ick. yeah. You talk about <laughs> night and day. I went from a conservative Democrat to a ultra, ultra liberal left left wing whack whack job in, Socialist the, uh, in, the, in the mold. In the, her, her and Nancy, 
her and Nancy Pelosi would be a, two, 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 two great uh, birds of a feather. Cradle the grave. Yeah, no. Harlem and Devon. I'm just on the. I'm, I'm in the. I'm on the edge of of her congressional district. Her her district runs up at the north end of uh, uh, Chicago, northwest side, and then into Skokie and Niles and and Lincolnwood. So uh, so Skokie and Lincolnwood. Uh, Jan Chikowski, I think you kind of catch my drift of uh, where her al where her uh, constituents uh, live. Oh yeah, where uh, uh, Bill's is uh, Lorraine Murphy. If you haven't voted yet, L Lorraine Murphy is running uh, for judge, and uh, you can't vote for her, Jack. You're out of the district. But she's a former state's attorney, yeah. uh, and. Uh, Grandfather was a fire uh, captain, and uh, her brother is a fireman now. Yeah. Uh, so any anyone uh, listening to us, yeah. give Lorraine Murphy a vote for judge if you haven't voted yet. Also, uh, uh, Brian Sexton, another former state's attorney, friend of mine. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, be, be too late by the time they get this. Yeah. Time. Oh yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah. Uh, have, did Did you vote yet, Jen? I'm there. No, I didn't vote yet. Uh, you yeah. you are you are a citizen, aren't you? Uh, does that matter now? Uh, no, <laughs> yeah. just get it. Yeah. Uh, we were talked about that yeah. earlier. You got to get a you Chicago. Challenge, you you got to get a Chicago ID card. Yeah. And then yeah. you then you can vote. Yeah. There's a, a card to prove that I'm illegal. You know, it's ridiculous. Yeah. The uh, uh, the the uh, the politicians. I. Uh, I mean, every time I think about you know, I've heard the expression when people call politicians whores and I say D don't say that around me because that's an insult to every whore I've ever known yeah. in my life uh, yeah. at least a, at least a whore fulfills the service when you pay her the politician Tom. just promise promise Tom something Bill, Bill. did you you know speaking of speaking of political whack jobs the mayor of New York did you see his latest he, he's no. taking all the uh, guns and uh, armed security out of New York schools oh, yeah, yeah. but in the same token to can, can can we say hypocrite? And the same token, he is uh, still his his armed security surrounding him. Mm -hmm. Now, how does uh, how does that work? I mean, you don't want anyone else to have a gun, but you're surrounded twenty four hours a day with people that are armed. I mean, yeah. uh, does that make any kind of sense? Sure, do as I say, well, do as I do. I right? Yeah. You know what you what you just said before, Tom? What's that about? Uh, Whores, confronting whores and politicians. Oh, yeah. uh -huh. That uh, makes me think of a very good friend of ours and uh, close acquaintance of yours, Bill, Joe Muskell, who's been dead over a year now. Right. He used to say, like, I'll try to person and says, I got more respect for a whore than some on the street than these mouth politicians. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's, uh, I, I mean, uh, I, yeah. it, I guess it says a lot about, uh, we, we again, we talked about it earlier it, w when I was talking about JB's uh, commercials. Yeah. Uh, you know, when he said he had to step in and help out his mother, you know, like insinuating that he was, a, you know, a stock boy at Costco or, you know, yeah. the, the man's a billionaire. You know, but it, 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 it the electorate of Illinois, uh, the, the man, th the governor that was elected not once but twice is now in jail. So yeah. I, uh, should I, should I just rest my case? Yeah. Well, how many did we had go to jail? You know. <coughs> I think we had like some somebody s somebody said L Louisiana has the record for governors in jail. I don't know if that's yeah, true or not. Huh. I thought we d I thought we did. We what well what well let's figure it out. We had uh, uh, Kerner, Blagojevich, <coughs> well, Walker, uh, Kerner. Kerner. Yeah. Uh, was that it? There's uh, only only three. But wasn't it Walker wasn't out, out of office, and it wasn't political? My cousin George. Yeah, he was out of office. Yeah. You're right about that. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe, yeah. Mm. Well, it's just like there's two oh. there's two convicts at Statesville waiting in line to eat in the cafeteria in Windex. Boy, service around here is terrible. It's getting worse every day. It was a lot better when you were governor. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> so, yeah. so, okay, if I sign off now, guys? What's that? I'm going to sign off, okay? Okay. All right. Uh, hey, yeah, take care of yourself. Uh, we hope to see you back uh, the next see, program. I best wishes, Jack. Plan. All the best. Good luck, Jack. Okay, Jack. Bye. Yeah. Well, there we are. Yeah, like, there we are. Yeah, like like I say, you know, John is a uh, 
is a classic example of don't judge a book by its cover. Yes. Uh, he yes. was uh, he was quite he was quite the athlete. He, he was also a professional wrestler. Wrestling. Yes. Uh, so. All right. Well, let's uh, let's wrap up uh, uh, politics, and uh, we've got about fifteen more minutes here to do that, and then we can get uh, get yeah. on our topic of uh, discussion: uh, neighborhoods, uh, communities, and uh, community names. Uh, okay. So, uh, let me bring something up here, Tom. Okay. The the Supreme Court is going to rule. Uh, probably in June, I, I think they said, June or July, on, uh, uh, well, freeloaders in the unions. Right, Uni union participation and dues. Right, and uh, uh, I don't know what the, what the FOP or what the police unions have, but uh, uh, we fought hard. I didn't even know what it was, you know, when they, they brought it up is uh, people that didn't want to join our union when we were negotiating contract. And uh, uh, as far as I was concerned, uh, uh, no, every you know, you had to join. Well, no, the Labor Relations Board said that, no, you don't have to. You can, uh, you can go and uh, uh, pay a fair share, which w was what we called them, fair right, share yeah. guys. Uh, I I still say they're freeloaders, but anyway, uh, it was they had to pay like, I believe it was like sixty five percent of what the union dues were, and that was uh, to pay for the union to negotiate and uh, you know for for everything else except political uh, contributions. They they didn't have to pay for that. Now they want out of that. And and the guy that is uh, has backed them and pushed them through this is our present governor. Uh, I I thought that the guy would be a union uh, uh, lover, or union guy, but uh, I guess not. Uh, yeah, he's he, he's not in uh, in in again being a union member and my family union members uh, very pro union although. We can talk about the faults uh, after I get through saying what I'm saying. In J.B. Pritzker's defense, he is very pro, pro union, for for whatever reason. Uh, but unions, I if if the if the Supreme Court rules in in uh, not in favor of the unions, in other words, you don't have to pay. That that is really going to be devastating to unions and union membership. Oh, I can see what mm -hmm. what devastating is right. Uh, I can see uh, the inside of these factories and wherever right. uh, uh, these guys that uh, a freeloader would be a, 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 a just a common word. You right. know? What's what's the percentage of American workers are unionized? You know, yeah, uh, non low, non, non government. Yeah. It's about seven percent, I believe. It's the lowest yeah. lowest in history. Yeah. Now, all government workers are union. No, not not necessarily, but that's the majority. I think yeah. nationwide, it's it, it. I think it's under twenty percent oh, union oh, union membership. There, the the right to work states. I think now there's they outnumber the the union states. I do too. Yeah, yeah. I do too. And. Uh, uh, but the thing is, what I tell people, and again, no matter what you think of unions, every single benefit that you have now as a worker, you got because of unions. Unionizing and, and I tell and people, do you think do you think that the uh, you know the uh, the Rockefellers and the uh, and the uh, uh, the the, the uh, titans of industry pre-union? Do you think that out of the kindness of their heart, they said, oh, you know, these people are, are my workers are working too mm -hmm. hard, so I'm going to give them that. Mm -hmm. No, all that was fought for by unions. Mm -hmm. The, the, uh, uh, the five-day work week, the eight-hour days, the lunch breaks, the mm -hmm. health care. No child labor. Ev 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 right, every, right, every, mm -hmm. s every, s every single benefit they got. You know, in, uh, to, you know, Unions really missed the boat because they didn't organize all of the new, basically new occupations. All the the uh, 
the IT workers, office workers, insurance, people, all that, they're, they're all non-union. But they are taking advantage of the benefits they got through mm -hmm. union Unionization. participation. Right. right. And, and getting back to the Supreme Court, the, the, the latest nominee, uh, excuse me, the latest justice, he was confirmed, uh, he is this, the swing vote. Sodish is yeah. that name? He's the swing vote on the court, and right. uh, a, a good friend of mine who was very heavily involved in the unions at O'Hare, he was uh, president of one of their, there's about four or five different unions uh, at O'Hare Field, maybe more, and he said it, it's, it doesn't look good. Mm. It, it does not look good, and, uh, and he gets the input nationwide. He says supposedly uh, the transit workers in New York City, they've already said that if if that if the if the uh, Supreme Court rules unfavorably, uh, they're 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 not paying anything. Why should they? Yeah, you know that's their that's their attitude. Right. I know well, on the police department when I went on, we didn't have uh, any union. We didn't have a bargaining agent. And I tell guys, younger guys on the job now, what they used to do to us, and they tell me. Well, they they couldn't do that. that, that no, that would have been a violation. I said, <laughs> let me let me let me give you the news here. Not only could they do it, they did it. When you came back from furlough, any comp time that you had on the books was eliminated, it was gone. And they said, well, didn't you? I said, well, who, who did you go to? There was nobody to go to at the yeah. time. You know, uh, there was no there was no agreement. You know, they, you, you you beef about it, and they say, well, gee, we're Really sorry that you don't like being a police officer. You know, there, there's the door. We uh, we just came through uh, our anniversary here, February 14th, of our strike, and uh, it's it's always a party time. Uh, guys in Vegas, guys in Florida, and of course here in Chicago, we had part a couple of parties. But uh, uh, I always get the emails. Uh, thanks. Thanks for what you did. It's too bad we can't tell these young guys what we didn't have and what you guys went out to get for us. Oh, yeah. They just don't realize, like you say, t uh, Tom, what what you could do if you, if you look cross-eyed at a boss and you were a north sider, you'd end up in Hegwish. Right. You know, right. You'd, you'd that type of thing. You'd walk into work and they'd say, oh, didn't anybody call you at home? Uh, yeah, you're, you're reassigned. Yeah. yeah. You don't work here. And there was no recourse whatsoever. Exactly, mm. exactly. And and I tell you what, the whole state, uh, us going on strike and getting our uh, contract uh, for a public uh, uh, union uh, helped get a collective bargaining bill for the whole state of Illinois. Right. And, uh, uh, you know, they should be thankful for that, that you had to stand up and do something like that. You know, it's, uh, uh, so I, I don't know. I, I do know that after we went back to work in Chicago, uh, what the, the uh, freeloaders and the scabs, how they were treated, and I can imagine now, how, it, how they will be treated if, if this Supreme Court comes back with that ruling. It's it's going to be going to be tough to work out there. Yeah, you, union really participation has oh. really really yeah. gone down, yeah. and especially in a city like Chicago. You know, I, I well, everybody I has, has gotten their their fair share for, out of it. For for example, years ago, if you threw up a picket line in the city of Chicago, no, nobody would cross it. Mm -hmm. Nobody. It was it was it was unconscionable. I mean, the, yeah, the Teamsters are they set up a picket line at this company or whatever. Well, that's it. You just don't go there. You don't. You yep. don't. Pa now it's like meaningless. It's like so what? We don't care. What's that got to do with us? Little little side story here of uh, <coughs> about the time that we went on strike. Just before that, the teachers went on strike, and uh, uh, in the Chicago public schools, uh, Jane Byrne was the the mayor. And uh, the guys, you know, we we would get uh, a box alarm in a school, and uh, or get a get a fire, get a run, get a medical, and uh, what are we going to do? What are we going to do? 
are we going to cross that picket line? And the guys didn't want to cross that picket line. You know, we knew that it was probably a phony run, but still, you got to check it out. And uh, what I did was, uh, uh, I, I forget her name now, she was president of the uh, teachers union. I said, tell your people that if that happens, get their picket captain out there and and open up, you open up the picket to us. Right. And we'll go in and, and check it out and then come out. And that worked well. That worked very well. You know, when I when I knew that unions were really going downhill is in Las Vegas, because I, like I said, I've got a place out there, but I've been going out there for 50 years. And uh, when they, when they, uh, had the first uh, um, non-union hotel and casino, and they, the the unions, uh, the uh, hotel and restaurant employees, uh, they picketed. Uh, they picketed at I think it was the frontier. It was the longest mm -hmm. uh, picket line in the history of of labor. It was years and years, uh, and then it was the frontier. Yeah, and then also downtown at the Golden Nugget, uh, and that went, and then the, the first the big non-union hotel was the Imperial Palace. It's called uh, something else now. Uh, but anyway, it, that was a sole ownership in that hotel, and that went non-union, and then there's a lot of non-union places. But in the 50s and, and 60s, and even into the 70s, I mean, you didn't, you know, Every single thing in Las Vegas was union. Was union, yeah. yeah. I I don't know what other people think about it, but uh, these Uber cars that go out and what's the other one? The light, the lift, lift. Uh, I I know that there is a union of cab drivers. Sure. Years ago, there'd be a lot of shooting going on. Oh yeah. Oh boy. They would, they would really, now, they're, they're pretty damn lucky. There's nothing out there now. Uh, and uh, I'm very surprised that, that uh, this situation exists. Do you think part of the problem could be the uh, very quick escalation of union dues over the years? And some honestly felt that you just weren't getting their money's worth. Um, yeah, that's, that's possible. It's a rationale. But, you know. but another thing is that the, the non-union shops are benefiting from the unions sure. because they're getting the, the same benefits. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, and it, it's hard to organize. I know the, uh, the uh, about three years ago now, my wife and I bought cars there almost at the same time. She bought a Chevy and I bought a Hyundai. The Hyundai was manufactured in Alabama. Her Chevy was manufactured in Mexico. So, so much for Buy American. But anyway, the Hyundai plant in uh, Alabama union, the, the uh, auto workers have been trying to organize there for a long time. And the, uh, the they've been unsuccessful. And the workers there are saying basically, hey, what are you going to do for us? You know, why should we pay 500 a year or whatever the union dues is? Uh, and uh, can we got the same benefits we've got now. Mm. Uh, so you're saying the non-union factories, say, in Alabama, paid basically the same thing as what the union... Well, they're not paid the, the same, but the benefits, you know... Well, that's what uh, I meant. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, close. Yeah, they're, they're, they're pretty close. So, and the, the, the you know, the companies, they, they know that. You know, they say... And they discourage, uh, right. they they discourage unions because I know unions uh, they have a lot of power. I know I was uh, w when I was going to school, uh, one of my summer jobs was at the uh, uh, U.S. Steel paint mill. The U.S. Steel made their own paint. It was at North Avenue and Troop, and uh, I joined the union. Uh, I didn't have to join, but I wanted to join. Uh, because, you know, seasonal workers, they don't have to join. But I joined, and uh, the the uh, the uh, the head of the, uh, the paint mill, the head of the mill, if he wanted to talk to a union member, the uh, shop uh, steward 
he had to be present. Uh, and mm. the, the the rules and regulations had to be strictly, were strictly enforced. I mean, we got uh, we got a half hour because it was so dirty working there and you're covered with paint and all this dust. And now when I think back on it, I said how hel- unhealthy that was. But anyway, uh, half hour before uh, you got off, we used to punch in and punch out. You had a half hour cleanup time. Oh, excuse me, Tom. It's time for another intermission. Oh, okay. We'll be right back after these messages of interest Continue and importance. <laughs> Hi friends, do you need a carpet for your living room, dining room, bedroom, den, family room, or even your outdoor patio? Well, the place to go for a great deal is the Carpet Warehouse, which is located at 4300 West Montrose Avenue in Chicago, or give them a call at area code 773-283-0100. So remember, friends, for a great deal on any carpeting you may need for your living room, dining room, bedroom, den, family room, or even at outdoor patio, go or call the Carpet Warehouse at 4300 West Montrose Avenue in Chicago or call 773-283-0100. Now, they are on Montrose Avenue. They are east of Cicero Avenue or the Kennedy Expressway exit on Montrose Avenue. So the Carpet Warehouse, for great deals on any carpeting you may need, 4300 West Montrose Avenue or call 773-283-0100. Remember, for a great deal on any carpeting for your home, Go to the Carpet Warehouse, 4300 Montrose Avenue, and once again, their phone number is area code 773-283-0100 for a great deal. Now back to our discussion. Uh, okay, w- uh, one final thought. Uh, we're talking about unions and the benefits of unions. And the, uh, and as I was saying, when I worked at uh, U.S. Steel Paint Mill, it was in the contract that you got a half hour to clean up. And uh, uh, But now our topic of the day, neighborhoods, communities, uh, names of communities. Uh, I'd, li- I'd like to do this, and I'll, I'll start off just briefly uh, where you grew up, uh, did you move, are you out of the area, are you in the area, do you still know people there? And I'm going to start off by saying that I grew up at 63rd and Hermitage, uh, in the Englewood uh, area. The area certainly has changed a lot since I lived there. But I went to uh, St. Theodore High School, 62nd, excuse me, St. Theodore Grammar School, 62nd Polina, St. Rita High School, it was still at 63rd and Western at the time. And then when that area was kind of destroyed by the uh, FHA and uh, letting, letting people buy homes uh, for uh, $400 down and then defaulting on them and living them for two years, the neighborhood was basically destroyed. But from 63rd and Hermitage, uh, my next move, I was still, I went on the job, but I was still living with my parents. And we moved to a 66 in Whipple, which is in the Marquette Park area. Just, uh, we lived just south excuse me, just north of Marquette Park. And then uh, the next move, uh, I bought a two-flat at uh, 63rd and Kildare, which is in the Midway area, neighborhood. And uh, then I became the landlord for my parents. And, uh, and then from there, I got married uh, and I moved north. So I'm uh, I'm I'm coast to coast. Uh, I'm, I've, as a ma- matter of fact, I'm coming up to to living half of my life on the south side and half of my life on the north side. But I moved to uh, Schreiber in Normandy, which is basically uh, Milwaukee and Devon, 
uh, area. The uh, it's uh, the uh, uh, it's the uh, it's not Ed it's east of Edison Park, uh, Norwood Park, the Norwood Park uh, area. And then when I retired, we bought some property out in uh, moved out of the city and bought some property out in Harvard, Illinois. Had some horses on it, and then came back to the city and basically in the same area, the Norwood Park uh, area where I am at uh, today. Bill. What were your origins? Of I that I was uh, born and raised at uh, in Rogers Park, fifty nine hundred on uh, Lakewood, and uh, went to St Gertrude's uh, Grammar School, and uh, from there over to St George in Evanston, and uh, uh, we moved out to Des Plaines for a while uh, when it was. Uh, Oh, I don't even think it was. It wasn't O'Hare Field. Uh, it was before O'Hare Field. There was cornfields and such, and uh, raised chickens and rabbits. Uh, but uh, uh, and and thumbed a ride down Tui Avenue into uh, Evanston to go to St. George, and from there to up to Marquette. But uh, uh, in the meantime, I I uh, worked for veterinarians and wanted to be a veterinarian so bad. Um, at Marquette, I was taking pre-med to go in there, but I had bought property with from friends of mine, uh, a farm, and uh, not realizing at that young age what that farm equipment cost, I needed a job. <coughs> and I asked my dad one day, uh, he was uh, he was the uh, third generation on the fire department, and uh, I said, hey, Pa, I need a job. You know, what What do you think? He said, uh, let me talk to uh, uh, a friend of mine. And uh, he did. Uh, I was on the Chicago Fire Insurance Patrol the next week, and... Uh, Forty-six years later, I retired from the Chicago Fire Department then and uh, uh, had my shortcomings, I guess you would call them. Uh, I thought that was just interesting, uh, where uh, you had to be a resident of the city of Chicago to, to be a, a, an employee. And uh, twice I got fired for living... Uh, outside of the city of Chicago, uh, once in Rolling Meadows and once in Arlington Heights. And uh, now uh, I'm retired. I can live wherever I want. And uh, guess where I'm living? Chicago. In the city of Chicago. Oh, there you go. <laughs> in the Ravenswood area. Ravenswood, right. Yeah. Right. And uh, uh, I, think I, uh, I, I, I think I did some good things in between there. Rich? Yeah. Except for uh, some educational and teaching gigs, I've been a lifetime Northwest Sider of the city of Chicago. Living basically in the same home all along near Addison between uh, Austin and Central. You might say the southern part of the Portage Park community area or neighborhood. Okay. okay. Uh, I'm all mixed up. I was <laughs> really? born in Little Rock, Arkansas, right around Ooh. VE Day. My dad was stationed at a fort called Camp Joseph T. Robinson, which is now Little Rock Air Force Base. And I don't know exactly when we moved to Chicago, but my brother was born at Mercy Hospital, and we were at 42nd and Princeton mm -hmm. for a while. What's your first memory of Chicago? Uh, as a kid shopping? or? Uh Actually, it was when we were in Oak Park. We moved to Oak Park in 1950. Ooh. Wow. And uh, we were on East Avenue. And I was eh, maybe 10 years old. And I had to cut the grass. Well, Real more. Yeah. yeah. Real. So this is on Sunday. And a cop car come by. <laughs> and he's sitting there. Like, what are you doing? I said, cutting the grass. Uh, we don't cut the grass in Oak Park on Sundays. Interesting. So I said, can I 
finish it? He says, let me talk to your dad. So, okay. So I finished it and then uh, went to Ascension Church until I was second in second grade. And I probably have the record for being maybe the only kid that repeated second grade. And then uh, I went and we got into some hassle. And, you know, go to the, the principal's office. My mom came to the principal. Well, come on, let's go. You're going to Hawthorne School. So I went there until yeah, we moved to Kyler Avenue, which is 6300 west and about 1150 south, where we live now. And I went to Irving School. And then in in 60, I went to Park River Forest. Hmm. Worked for my dad. I graduated, worked for my dad for a while. And uh, my dad died in 67. So I drove a truck for well, about 12 years, a little place called Staley Supply. Delivered boilers, air conditioners, and stuff like that. And then I got a job with the Burlington Northern Railroad. And that was okay. So uh, for a little while, I worked at a, a place. Uh, they, they fixed lawns and gardens, and, and I fixed their equipment. And then I went to the, I call it the Village of Oak Park, but it, it's what they call a partner agency. It basically was. And I went there for 21 years. And then in 19, or 2011, I got a little part-time job at Shaker Management, which, you know, manages a bunch of buildings. And I'm still there. And uh, and now I'm a member of the fire museum, and I've been there about seven years fixing trucks, of all things. And uh, that's about it. Well, that, that's great. You know, uh, I play, uh, well, I play with the police, uh, Chicago police pipes and drums, bagpipe, uh, but I also play with the Shannon Rovers uh, bagpipe band. And during the St. Patrick's Day season, we play... Uh, over 200 jobs. We split up into, on St. Patrick's Day, we split up into six different groups and play all kinds of bars and restaurants, and we played a couple weddings and things like that. But we we travel around uh, uh, the city almost, with, well, actually, from south side to north side. And it's amazing to me how some of these neighborhoods have changed in the years I mean, the West Madison uh, neighborhood went from uh, Skid Row, basically, to a high line area. Supposedly, the only demographic, uh, population demographic that is increasing in the city of Chicago is millennials, the, the yuppies, basically. The near north side, uh, near now the south loop, uh, the near west side, uh, all the way up the uh, the lakefront, those those areas. I mean, they are really. I mean, they are being built, uh, new homes, uh, condos, uh, apartment uh, rentals, restaurants. There's a uh, taking a sociology class. There was a. Uh, it's called the Burgess theory of concentric circles. And what this guy Burgess did is he looked at the demographics in a lot of older cities, uh, mostly east, you know, Midwest cities, and he came to the conclusion that every 50 years a neighborhood or an area completely turns around. It goes from a very nice area mm -hmm. to a very bad area to a very nice area. And when you look at it, in the city of Chicago, you can kind of yeah you you can kind of see that. 
I think uh, that's accelerating now a little bit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They, yeah. What do they call it? Maybe gentrification? Or yeah, something? right. 20, yeah, exa- years, yeah, so. yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. yeah it, it, right. Uh, and uh, uh, DePaul area, for example, when I was in high school, the Catholic League played their uh, basketball uh, Catholic League championship at DePaul, the old alumni hall. And in the 60s, you took your life in your hands going into those areas. I mean, you talk about you needed a gun. You, you needed two guns. I mean, it was, and now, I mean, the way I look at some of those old uh, brownstones, the, those uh, three flats, in the 60s, you could have bought the whole block for what you pay for one of them right, uh, right now. Oh, mm-hmm. so, uh, again, uh, West Madison. You know, condos, uh, right. hotels, the loop. I remember when I was on the job, really in the 60s, maybe early 70s, the loop went dead at night. After mm-hmm. dark, the loop was dead. Right. Uh, yeah. and, the, and then it was, um, uh, it was, it was uh, uh, crime ridden at night, and then it turned, it turned around. Uh, basically, and now, uh, in a, uh, along the river, they have the river walk that's really being developed. You know, developers come to the city of Chicago and they <coughs> and they say, you know, in other cities that have rivers, the river is like the main attraction. That's where people build. But because Chicago has the lake, the lake was the attraction, and the river was basically neglected. Mm-hmm. But downtown now, they're starting to build uh, restaurants and hotels, and I, th- I think it's even going to go down to to the south south branch. Developers are looking at those areas, South Loop. Right. Uh, and if you haven't been around those areas in a while, I mean, if you moved out of the city of Chicago 20 or 30 years ago and came back, you wouldn't even know where you were. Yeah, right. that's the you same know. thing with um, my dad. He was, his, my, my grandmother had a grocery store. Uh, on Harrison and Levitt. Mm. And it was going down, down, down. And in 67, I think there was three buildings on the block. And now, well, now it's the Fishbine Institute is there and the, whatever they call the morgue, the right. medical examiners. And it was right on the same, basically the same property as her gr- grocery store. But... Uh, you used to go to Harrison and Western, and like you say, you would have to have a gun there. Right. And now, I mean, going all the way down to where the museum is, is it's pretty nice. And and uh, the well, same the same thing with my my mom. She was on the south side around Bridgeport. In Bridgeport, that I can remember, never really got that bad. But it's all gentrified now. And yeah, uh, that area of along the. Uh, Sox Park, or uh, yeah. what is it, Guaranteed Rate Field, excuse right. me, yeah. uh, which no one ever calls it that, or right. the, uh, or the cell. Uh, yeah, that, that area, I mean, it's amazing things that are being done. Well, uh, when I went through the police academy, it was at 720 West O'Brien, which is bas- basic basically the Maxwell Street area just uh, west of the expressway. The, the site of the police academy, now they, there are million dollars well actually they're they're over a million do- million dollar townhomes built on on that site right and it, it it's un it's unbelievable and the city you know is what gonna gets move me. it west because all that property is getting so, or the fire academy that property is getting right. so expensive yeah. i guess they're going to have somewhere on douglas boulevard chicago avenue Ch- they're going to build the new police and fire, fire academy. right yeah yeah it's uh it, it, it you don't hear it anymore, and it used to be the thing that when when you ask somebody where, hey, where are you from? Oh, I'm from St. Gertrude's. I'm from. Right. It was always, it was always the parish, the parish sure. that, that where you were where you were from. Now I don't. I you know not everybody's Catholic and, and <laughs> Christian and that, but uh, uh, you don't hear really that much anymore. Once in a while, no. some old timer will tell you. Well, good. Grow, growing up uh, in the 6300 block of Hermitage, uh, 
we knew every single person on the block. Mm -hmm. There was a six flat on the uh, uh, southwest corner that we knew most of the people in there. And then there was an apartment building at 63rd and uh, Hermitage on the corner that we knew, again, most of the people. But every mm -hmm. single house on the block, I mean, yep. not not only did we know to live there, we, we, we knew their family and right. friends and... And uh, right. I don't really think, it, again, in these, uh, we were talking about the millennials moving into the to the city. Uh, you don't you don't really see that. I don't think they're they have that that uh, family uh, uh, relationship no. with their with their neighbors. And now, if they live in a house six or seven years, that's a long time. Right. 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 But you're getting back to where you were saying you used to know everybody. When it got warm, they would sit out on the curbs. But yep. now, since air conditioning, everybody's locked up into their house. Right. That's a good point. Yeah. Even TV coming along, you start to keep people indoors. Right. Then they got the air conditioning. I right. remember as a kid, you know, bars would have TVs basically for the World Series. And that was a big thing back then. Right. But furniture stores would put TVs in their window, and people would stand around watching. And mm. now, Polk Brothers, yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. The you know, uh, different way of life in those days. Yeah, free air. So, I, well, I don't know if it was slower, but it, it was definitely different. Well, another thing, uh, when I was growing up, not everybody had a car. You know, my, my family right, didn't true. have a car, That's and the, the kids didn't have them. So you were kind of locked into your your own little. Uh, neighborhood i remember when at 63rd and hermitage there was a, a family that moved they moved to uh uh southwest highway west of western and i remember thinking well we'll never see we'll never see them again <laughs> <laughs> and i mean it was ba basically walking distance but you know you our our neighborhood extended like from the railroad tracks to ashland and from 59th to uh to uh, like sixty seventh, and th I mean that was it, right? You know your your whole your whole community. I mean, and uh, back then people would be born in a neighborhood, grow up there, work there, and die. Well, basic did, basically right. the same mm -hmm. parish. Mm -hmm. Sure, because there was a tavern in every neighborhood. Well, too. sure, yeah, every <laughs> every couple yeah. of blocks. Yeah, you know, the, uh, and don't forget your social the center was either the church or the tavern. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And don't forget, there was no TV in a lot of those right, right. there either. And back then, too, you talk about cars. The normal mode of transportation was usually streetcars. Yep. Right. Yeah. And I mean, they were all over the place. Well, you know, talking about bars, you know, uh, our, last, uh, our last mayor, our last daily, Rich Daly mayor, he was the one that put the, the end to the local neighborhood bars. You know, a lot of people, even today, they don't realize this. You know, in the old days, when you bought a bar, you the liquor license, you transferred mm -hmm. to whoever the new owner was. Right. And it was kind of an automatic thing. Mm -hmm. Not anymore. And that hasn't been since he was in office. What do you think motivated Mayor Daly to do away with the neighborhood well, he, bars? Well, he, he, he said he didn't like them, and he said he was never in one. He said he was never in a bar. I mean, I don't know if that's that true. That is hard to believe. Yeah, growing up in Chicago. Yeah. I mean, it's kind of hard to avoid right. And in Bridgeport, oh. I see that the uh, the uh, Archdiocese uh, of Chicago is uh, planning to uh, shut down or combine uh, all of the different parishes in the Bridgeport area. I think it was in uh, today's paper yesterday. Yes, yeah, yeah. Oh, and no. I didn't realize that there were that many. I just mm -hmm. you know was in that area. But uh, it sure has changed. I mean, yeah. I mean, they the neighborhoods had everything from bars to little grocery stores to funeral homes. Yeah, mm -hmm. Ma and pa stores. Right. The, the milk. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And it, what amazes me back in the twenties, in thirties, maybe even the forties, what people made, and what what ornate churches. Mm. They contributed to. Mm -hmm. I mean, you you would have a church, and you'd be walking six blocks, and there's another one, and it seemed like they out tried to outdo yeah. it. And they, Every ethnic and they were very expensive, church, and yeah. the amount yeah. of money yeah. people would 
donate. Now, granted, construction was a lot cheaper, but they still had to kick in a lot of money. Sure. Yeah, yeah they, almost every ethnic group had their own parish. I know I, I went to uh, St. Theodore. That was kind of a mix, Irish, German, some Polish. But St. Mary of Mount Carmel that was on 60... Uh, yeah, 67th Street, which is on the, the southern edge of our neighborhood, uh, that was solid Italian. I mean, they used to have the Italian Carnival right. every year, which mm -hmm. was a big, uh, 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 a big celebration for the neighborhood. There was a big thing when you were a kid to be able to go up to the Italian Carnival and uh, ride on the Ferris wheel right. and the tilt a whirl and get a get an Italian ice and a uh, right. an Ital Italian sausage sandwich and uh, right. Didn't they have, I don't know if it was part of that festival, but in Melrose Park they had one. Oh, yeah. Where they carried a statue of Mary around, and they started, hmm. you know, if if you've seen a $10 bill, hey, get rid of that thing. It was all 50s and $100 yeah, bills. Yeah, they did, they did that St. Mary Mount Carmel, too. They used to have. Uh, it was a, during the summer, July, maybe. Right. They, they had a couple of them. They used to have St. Rocco, which was a big one. And when I was in the band at St. Rita, our band director, uh, Lou Ricci, who was Italian, they used to have what they call feast bands, and the band would yeah. march around. As a matter of fact, if you watch the, I think it's God, is it Godfather 2, uh, mm -hmm. where they show the, the, the statue being paraded around, and they show the band playing, well, the feast right. band. But I think it was they fun. call them feasts. But it was not funny, uh, when we played in the feast band, the only Italian was the director, Lou <laughs> Ricci, every, because, uh, because when he was packing up, passing out the sheet music, somebody said to him, Lou, uh, what's Funicelli Funicella? He says, that's Funiculi Funicula. <laughs> <laughs> oh. yeah, just a yeah. <laughs> yeah, but they marched around the neighborhood, and that was the, that was the big thing. You would mm -hmm. come out and you would pin your uh, uh, donation on the, uh, and then they, they, when we were playing in the band, uh, they, uh, they wanted, to, they wanted to us to play Ave Maria, and uh, March Royale, which was, I guess, the Italian national anthem when Mussolini was in power, because <laughs> they pin a, you know, they pin a hundred dollars. And I'm talking fifty years ago, right? Or longer, you know, when a hundred dollar bill meant something. Yeah. <laughs> and they would, uh, they, they would say, "My March Royale, hey, come on, music, uh, music." Uh. Yeah. <laughs> Speaking of Mussolini, is that <laughs> column still on? Yeah. Is it still I, they up? Haven't, they haven't, they're still up. That's, they haven't that's what, between... Uh, the, the monument to Balbo that he brought that, over Is that north or south of McCormick Place? Uh, south. South? South, yeah, okay. South, yeah. Yeah. I guess yeah. you go by it and you run in and, and he said, what's that? I said, that's about 2,000 years old. Yeah. Yeah, ah, yeah Bel <laughs> Balbo, that's, that's a, another one of the most uh, mispronounced uh, streets in the city. Everyone says Balboa. Right, yeah. but it's Balbo, and it's named after that Italian uh, flyer that yeah. that brought a fleet and landed on uh, amphibious planes and uh, landed on Lake Michigan. How was about that the Columbian Exposition, uh, wasn't it? Uh, yeah, I think it might have been. Yeah, yeah. 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 Uh, well, that was be cent century of progress. Century of progress. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, Columbian was eighteen ninety three. Right, right, right. Yeah, but like Bill just said, uh, Gothi. Yeah. Yeah, Gothi. Well, Gothi. And then our original Mayor Daly used to call O'Hare O'Hara Field. Oh, sure. Yeah. Oh, That's yeah. right. You can always tell when there's a new uh, announcer, radio, TV, whatever, uh, in in town about how they mispronounce the street names. Right. Oh, Paul, yeah. Paulina. Uh, oh, even Honor. the ones Honor. been there. Hon right. Honor. Yeah. The street I live on is Kyler Avenue, and boy, do they butcher, butcher that yeah. up. Yeah. You can always get into Nina versus Nina. Ni right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and there's a big difference there. Or yeah. Well, yeah. it's Narragansett turns into Nagel. Well, that's well the, the <laughs> Chicago colloquialisms, you know, when you tell people from Chicago about it, they, they don't see, they don't understand what you're talking about. And there's so many of them. The one, one big one you were talking about, somebody was talking about cutting grass. You, in Chicago, when you say I bought a new lawnmower, now you don't see well what's that? But it's not a lawnmower; it's a lawn mower. Mower, right? It's yeah. a lawn mower. Mm. Yeah. Right. But in Chicago, it's a lawn mower. I, yeah. bu I bought Very a lawn. I bought a lawn mower. Right. In how many people, even in Chicago, misspell or mispronounce the names Chicago? Uh, uh, Chicago, all. Chicago. You're right. Uh, right. Another Chicago. Then they argue co colloquialism with you. is wh where is it at? Now where is it? Where is it at? Right. 
Do you know another uh, uh, street? Uh, you know what what Kedzie is? What name Kedzie is? What up north? Uh. All of a sudden, you go down Kedzie Avenue and it turns into Jersey. Oh yeah, oh that's, that's right. a little strange yeah, somewhere. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 yeah, 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 and and Holman, Kimball. You know, it's uh, right. No wonder people get lost. And you tell people, if you're ever lost, remember... Gentlemen, I'm afraid it's time for another intermission. Okay. You've been listening to Meet the Chicago Historians. We'll be back soon. And the lake is always in this too. Well, friends, it's that time of the year again. When you want to check your roof, siding, and gutters and make sure they're in great shape in case we have any bad weather. You may want to check the roof, siding, and gutters on your home and make sure that they are in good shape. You don't want mold or mildew in your attic or crawl space or drip, drip, drip on the ceilings in your rooms or have your walls damaged by leaky gutter or bad siding. So don't have double expense. Sooner or later you're going to have to get it repaired. So why not call Besh Brothers Roofing, Siding and Gutters at area code 630-616-1359. Mike Besh will drive over in his shiny red truck with ladders on top and Mike will look over your roof, siding, and gutters and give you an estimate and go from there. So once again, don't have double expense. Call Besh Brothers Roofing, Siding, and Gutters for a free estimate at area code 630-616-1359. That's Besh Brothers Roofing, Siding, and Gutters at area code 630-616-1359. Call today for a free estimate. That's Best Brothers Roofing, Siding, and Gutters, 630-616-1359 for a free estimate. 630-616-1359. Best Brothers Roofing, Siding, and Gutters. <music> Okay, everyone, welcome back. Uh, we're glad you stuck around. We are on our final segment here of uh, this uh, uh, edition of Chicago Historians. I know you're upset, but don't don't fret. We still have a half hour left, so don't stay so stay stay tuned. Uh, I, I'd like to to bring a subject up here, uh, Tom. Uh, we're we're in the final thing there. Uh, this December, uh, we are uh, not celebrating we were memorializing the uh, fire at uh, Our Lady of the Angels school that killed uh, a, a lot of kids and and several nuns 94 to be exact uh, this December 1st will be the 60th anniversary of that fire and uh, we are going to have a program at the Fire Academy, Chicago Fire Academy, uh, at 10 o'clock on December 1st. That's a Saturday. And the next day, uh, December 2nd, at Holy Family Church, which is at uh, 1000 block on Roosevelt Road, uh, we will have a uh, mass uh, to uh, uh, memorialize these these. Uh, victims of this disaster. Uh, for those that don't know, Our Lady of the Angels uh, school uh, fire uh, changed the fire regulations, uh, not only of Chicago, but uh, uh, and not only of this country, but of the international uh, uh, school system. Uh, it was, uh, hopefully it will never happen again uh, but uh, it, it it is something that we remember every year, and uh, like I say, it was 60 years ago. Uh, some of these people that were in the fire uh, are in their 70s, 80s, 
and uh, and I know even a couple of the uh, uh, people have their parents also living, and uh, uh, this means a lot to them to that that this is uh, remembered. So, put that on your calendar, December first, ten o'clock at the Fire Academy, on Decoven. Uh Ten o'clock, we will have a uh, fellow by the name of uh, Jim uh, will. Uh, put on a program, and he is, is quite interesting, uh, and of course, uh, uh, quite uh, tear-making also. Uh, and then on December 2nd, we will have the Mass, and we, we don't have the time on that yet. We're trying to get the the uh, the Bishop, the Archbishop, uh, Cardinal Supic, uh, there and tie him down so that we can get a Mass hopefully in the afternoon because of the age of all of these people. So uh, uh, please uh, remember that. Uh, also, we have a quite a uh, memory section at the Fire Museum. Fire Museum is at 5218 Southwestern, and uh, our next open house is the 24th of March, which is uh, this coming Saturday. Um, uh, it's uh, it'll also be uh, in April. It'll be the 28th of April, and we have uh, uh, a lot of uh, of the of the uh, leftovers, whatever you want to call them, from the Our Lady of the Angels Fire, uh, and we have an exhibit of it. So, uh, and everybody's invited. That's from 10 until 2 on the 24th, and then the 28th of April. I just wanted to bring that up before we end our program today. Uh, no, that, that that sounds like uh, something of gr great great interest. If anyone can uh, get down there, I know that I was in grammar school myself when that fire occurred, and I remember hearing the news. And uh, w actually, we were really too young to comp actually comprehend what a tragedy that was. Uh, but eventually, it it did hit home. Oh yeah, uh, my my company, the company that I was assigned to, uh, was at the fire. Uh, I wasn't. I had been drafted in the army, and I was in France at the time. But uh, my dad called me, and uh, uh, when I thought about it, and him telling me what was going on and what happened and so forth, I said, "You know, Pa, the only fire I'm glad I'm I'm not going to be at. Right. Just." Uh, uh, anybody was there, any fire right. uh, personnel that was there uh, just did not want to talk about it later on, uh, especially if you had kids. Some devastating photos of that. Right. There are devastating photos, and you, I tell you what, uh, Rich, you haven't seen uh, the devastating photos that I have in my position. Uh, these were from a Dr. Seagrave who was the doctor at St. Anne's, and he was also a photography buff. And he had his camera there, and they worked on these kids, I mean, most of them. Right. Uh, and he took pictures uh, of them as they came in, and then for, you know, months later to see how they were progressing with their, you know, with their healing. Right. And uh, uh, he, of course, is, is gone but his uh, granddaughter uh, gave me these, and uh, we're we're not going to put them on display. Right. They're, they're just yeah, they're, they're too much. I got them locked right. in the safe. Yeah. yeah. Right. Uh, I was in eighth grade when it happened, and the thing I remember before that, I don't know regular kids, but I never even gave people dying a second thought, and that. That changed right, my it, mind. Yeah, yeah. It, it, it hit home. Right. I was down in El Paso, Texas, in the, in the service when, when that happened. And I was in the NCO club having something to eat. And um, my good, good friend uh, Richie and I, uh, we heard something about a fire in Chicago. Of course, I've been involved with, with, with fire, fire and fire departments since I was just a little kid. And I had called home and because my, my sister, Eileen, she went to St. Andrew's School, which is over on Addison and 
Plain and near Addison and Lincoln Avenue, and I heard something, and I called and wanted to make sure it wasn't St. Angela's schools, and I heard it was uh, Our Lady of the Angels Fire. No. And uh, that was that was very, very, very sad. You know, uh, uh, I, I just want to tell you people that uh, I grew up uh, at Addison and Western, Addison and Oakley, which is would be at the far west end of, La of Lakeview, Lakeview area. Uh, I was just, uh, when I was in my bedroom, uh, I could look out at my bedroom window and see Lane Tech's clock tower at uh, quarter eight in the morning. They would uh, play their, their, their school's theme song. And uh, also to the southwest of my bedroom, when I looked out the window, was good old Riverview Park. And I went to school, uh, kindergarten, first, second, third, and one year of fourth grade at Bell School, 3730 was Oakley Avenue, right down the street from where we lived. And then uh, I repeated fourth grade again at St. Angelo's School, which is uh, at uh, uh, Addison and Plaina be between Lincoln Avenue and, and Ashland. And uh, I, I went there because the reason why I re did fourth grade twice is because I had the, 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 the child's me uh, uh, disease, mumps, measles, whooping cough, everything that could under, and I had to redo fourth fourth grade the twice and when the second time my mom and dad says you're not going to bell school you're going to st andrews where you can get a catholic education and not only did i get a good catholic education but that is where i began my radio broadcast career on the altar of st andrews church that's where i began no. and that's where i was involved with radio broadcasting is that and where you learned to box too john no i didn't know but i used <laughs> to i used to go across the street to the to the uh, gymnasium and watch the boxing because we used to broadcast yeah, the uh, golden, bro golden gloves the golden right. gloves and and basketball in the whole nine yards and then i went to st benedict's high school which is over at irving park road and um love it i went there four years to uh to uh to uh, uh, to high school, and then after that, uh, uh, I worked for my dad at Broadway Buick, uh, which is at 5701 Broadway, Broadway in Hollywood, right on the corner. And my dad said, "You're not going to get involved in the automobile business like I did." He went across the street and talked to some of his good friends at uh, at the telephone company because that's where they had their North Division office at that at that time. And before you know it, and uh, uh, I, I began in 1958 and became a, a telephone man. I was with Illinois Bell for, for 37 years. Now, Tom, where did you say you live now? I live at the uh, in the Norwood Park area. Yeah. Whereabouts? Devon and uh, Harlem. Okay, that was my area when I when I was a telephone man. All through all right. there. All of Niles, all up and down uh, 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 Harlem Avenue and, and, uh, and Devon. That was that was my area. I went all the way to the city limits, Park Ridge, all the way uh, south. And I lived when I got married in 1966. I lived at 5754 North Moody, right on the corner of Moody and Ardmore. In fact, my my uh, uh, my uh, uh, daughter, she was uh, baptized at uh, Saint uh, Saint Tarsus's Church. And after I had just moved into the house on Moody Avenue, about two weeks later, there was a big food store right on the corner of Ar uh, Milwaukee and Ardmore, and they had a 5-11 alarm fire there. That, that burned down. And right on the other side was Gladstone Bakery and uh, all around. So I, I, I'm i very familiar with your area at uh, their time because that was where I was a telephone man for, for 37 years. You, with you guys just like to go to the hot dog place on <laughs> Devon yeah. and yeah. Milwaukee. In fact, that's all. In fact, you know, where that, you, know where Super dog. you know where Superdog is there on, on Harlem, and uh, uh, I put in the pay phones there at, uh, at, at the Superdog. And Taft High School, I put in the, all the pay phones over in, in that area there. So How many you, more so payphones are left on this? Now, I think you can count on one <laughs> hand how many payphones are left. So these darn cell phones uh, took, took that, all, took that right. all the way. So you were but, an um, installer? Yes, I was an installer. I was a repairman. And then after a fashion, I became a uh, dispatcher. I worked at uh, the telephone office at Grace and Western. I moved out of 3528 North Oakley, moved to, to 5754 Moody. And then after we were there for a year or so, we, we then bought a house over in Harwood Heights, 7437 Argyle. Mm -hmm. So when I'm living in, 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 in Harwood Heights, I'm going all the way.
way back to Grayson Western to work at the telephone company, and I lived just walking distance away from uh, from there when I was before I got married. John, John what are they doing? I, I see they're doing something with the old phone building there at Grayson Western. I have no idea. They're they're, they're changing it around to something. I have, I have no idea. Uh, I have no idea. In fact, I used to uh, uh, sit up uh, sit up on the third floor there and, and at that at that building there, and I could see WGN television. And then I have to tell you a little funny story. I was sitting uh, up there uh, dispatching, and I'm looking out the window, and there was a company right on Addison and Tallman that caught on fire. They had a lecture alarm fire on, on that on that building. So it would come lunchtime, and, of course, I put on my coat, and I'm going to run over there, and I'm going to visit guys because Engine 56, the company that I fan with, in fact, the lieutenant on Engine 56, Johnson Turk, I married his daughter. But anyways, I knew 56 was there, so I wanted to go over there. So I walked there, and I'm, I'm walking th over, and I'm, I see uh, where 56 is, so I'm kind of following their, their holes to see where the guys were at. And what do I do? I'm walking and walking and walking, all of a sudden I, f I, I fall, and I had water up to my neck. I walked off a loading dock into <laughs> into <laughs> in, into into this cold water. It was a day like it is out there today, and I had to be nosy. But I I lost I I, I didn't realize they had so much water that what they were pumping that the loading dock got filled and was even with the between the street and the floor of the of the building. And there I was, water up to my neck. And oh my God! I, and then I smelled from the oil or from whatever it is. So I went back to the telephone office, and my boss looked at me. He says, "What in the devil happened to you?" So I told him, "Is hey, you go home and change your clothes?" He says, "And then come back." So I, I have a lot of lot of stories, but that's where I grew up. I grew up at uh, uh, Addison Western. I went to Bell School, St. Andrew School. St. Benedict schools, and then we used to, a bunch of us guys used to walk down Addison Street to, to Wrigley Field and watch the game and then walk back home again, and uh, and that was where I grew up. And then, like I said, I, I got married, I moved over on Moody, and then up there from Ar Argyle, and then when I lived on Argyle, that's unfortunately where I got divorced. And then I moved uh, over on um, Melvina, 4241 Melvina, which is, I think that's Jefferson Park uh, over there. Uh, yeah, yes. 4241 Melvina, and then I was there for about three, four years. Then I grabbed the whole of Oscar, the, the young man that's, that lives with me, and we moved in here in this house where you're at right now in, in October 1st of 2005 and still here. Hey, John, when, when you first went with the phone company, was those the days where when you picked up the phone, you got the uh, number, please, the operator? No, we had dial tone at that time, uh, oh, Tom, but, but uh, oh. in, the, in, the, in the telephone, uh, my first assignment, when I, bec when I started with the phone company, uh, 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 September the 10th, 1958 is when I started with, with Illinois Bell. My first assignment was on Northwest Highway, 6001 Northwest Highway. In fact, if Tom, if you have a landline at home where you live now, that's where it comes out of, uh, right, uh, right on Northwest Highway at Neola. Interesting. And then, and then uh, uh, from there, then I went into um, into cable. Uh, I, I see you're, you you stay in a, in a, in a, in a, in a job just so long, and then you you get promoted. And then I went into cable, and I worked in the cable department. And then I worked with uh, 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 right around where I used to live, right in in the Lake Lakeview area is where I lived. And we were. Um, when WGN Radio and Television uh, built their studios over at 2501 Bradley Place, we had to put in a cable from the studios to go all the way to the Lakeview Telephone Office, which is on the corner of Sheffield and Addison, uh, to the south. Uh, uh, the, the telephone office is south of Addison. Wrigley Field is right across the street to the north uh, of Addison on Sheffield. And um, the, we were splicing uh, cables that go from WGN to, to the to the telephone office, and um, this one day, uh, see, I was a helper, an apprentice splicer is what they I was called, and um, when we when the when the splicer would get there, we take and open up the manhole, 
And always the, the, the splicer or always the, the cistern, like me, I would go down into a hole with a, the, the meter to make sure there was no gas down there. And then uh, uh, set up the lights, set up the, the, uh, the air, the, the air compressor to get the pump air down into the hole and get everything ready for us to, to, re to go down and work. As soon as it was all set, the splicer would go down and we would, would start working. Well, this one day, I, w I opened up the manhole, and I had put the guard out and, and got everything ready. And I went down, and I hollered out, coming up, coming up. And all of a sudden, the, the splicer, Art Davenport, he hollered, duck, 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 duck. And all of a sudden, boom. And what happened is some guy went through a red light on Lincoln Avenue, hit a car. The car spun around, hit the guard, the generator, the pump everything and, and and while the the guard we found about two blocks away from 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 where we were at if i had been 30 seconds sooner i would not be sitting here telling you about this story it's funny my dad was a contractor for illinois bell and you said the generator and the pump you don't know how many of those things I fixed when I was yep. 12, 13 yep. years yep. old. Yep. Mm -hmm. And they used to come in a big yellow box. That's remember? correct. That's correct. You and uh, the yellow box with, with a black stripe on it, too. For, right. Uh, yeah. Uh -huh. That's yep. what covered them. That's right. And, mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> Did yes. you have to fight off ever a bunch of rats down there? No, no. Unfort no unfortunately, there was one manhole that we worked at at uh, Devon. No, uh, not Devon, no, no. Lawrence and uh, Clark, uh, right up, uh, th there's another, the Edgewater Telephone Office was up uh, was up over in that area, and we were splicing, the c doing a uh, cable down there, and uh, the splicer that I was with, Art, da Art Davenport, we were splicing all of a sudden, he looked at me and he says, don't move, he says, but look to your right, and I looked to, the, to, to my right, and there was a pair of eyes looking at us. <laughs> And then after after he just went, you know, just tapped the cable, and the thing turned around and, and flew, you know, went yeah. back again. But that was, it was the only time we ever had. Uh, a big problem. That's interesting. Yeah. <laughs> so in other words, you were the human canary. Yes, right. <laughs> yes. But, uh, yes, I, I've had uh, a wonderful uh, time. I mean, I, I enjoyed living down in that area. And it, and uh, just a couple of weeks ago, I, I had to go down to uh the Comcast had Addis, uh, Ashland and uh, and uh, Lincoln Avenue and Belmont there to, to change some equipment. And I, my God, I tell you, when I went down there, I just could not believe it. I said to Oscar, I said, my God, has this area changed? Oh, I just could not believe uh, the old Belmont show, that's now a big, like a mall over there. And uh, you just kept the facade. It, uh, yeah. Oh, God. So anyways. Yeah. But anyways, that's my tale all about where I grew up and where I lived and my life history. Well, to well, what uh, extent do we think the expressways destroyed or damaged a lot of old line Chicago neighborhoods? Um, in Oak Especially Park, the they Kennedy. did. Cutting right through old Irving, that sort sure. of thing. Sure. You know. In Oak Park, they did a lot because those, that was all residential. And I think there was a Sioux Line Railway and a CTA, and, but they were right next to each other. But in Oak Park, they took up about two blocks and they bought all homes. No, no. And no. it basically went from what is in Oak Park Garfield to almost Harrison Street in Oak Park, which is not the Harrison Street. It is the Harrison Street in Chicago. And the problem there with uh, even now, the exit ramps off the Eisenhower are on the left, left side, side, which is mm. totally against you know, and, traffic. Customers. And what they do when you get around the Central Avenue or Laramie, it goes from four lanes to three lanes in Oak Park. No, as soon as you get past right. Oak Park around the Plains or First Avenue, and it goes back. And that's why if you're in this, the, the, what do you call it, the rush hour, mm. you'll inevitably get a backup no. Going through a park. When be, when I went on the fire department, they were building the Kennedy, and uh, I was on the north side, Knox and Sunnyside, and and uh, our we were busy all the time, and they were all single family, maybe two, three right. flats, right. Uh, nothing big, but but it it just you know completely cut up those neighborhoods. Right. Well, in well, the park that was the last yeah. section between Austin in Harlem and that was all because the state wanted to put up a put a off ramp at East Avenue and there was a Catholic school a block away 
and they fought mm-hmm. that and they fought that. But it was good for us because they had most of it done, and we'd go down there with a go kart and there run, and you know, the cop car is no no match to a go kart. Well, the the expressway system in Chicago always left a lot to be desired. You know, it, it's it's funny to go from like Harlem and and Archer, let's say, to Harlem and uh, uh, Higgins. You have to go. You have to go downtown. You have to go through the loop. Right. Yeah. It, that that's why they've been talking. Well, I haven't heard t- talk much lately, but for a year, few years back, they were really seriously considering the crosstown. Oh, true. That yeah. would cut like straight through. As a matter of fact, they and had a lot of Cicero. Ra- yeah. Yeah, railroad uh, right away right. that they w- they would have been able to use. But I haven't heard the discussion of the crosstown in years. Didn't they buy a lot of property? Yeah, they too? They, they did. You see a lot of empty lots yeah. along there. Yeah. Now the Stevenson was that that wasn't really an answer to it, was it? Oh no, no, because you, you got to go downtown. You know, so it's right. the it's the all uh, in the Roman Empire. Empire, all roads lead to Rome. Right. And you get on, you get on the expressway in Chicago. You head head through downtown. Yeah. yeah. Well, just uh, like the elevated system, pretty much everything goes yeah. downtown. You know? Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Right. But uh, I have to rethink that. Yeah, like where I'm living, a lot of people take the Kennedy to the Eisenhower. I said it's faster for me, either take Mannheim or uh, even. Well, sometimes Harlem, but sometimes Oak Park Avenue, too. And it's almost as fast, and you don't run into any, or you usually don't run into any big traffic. It's a hard call. Oh. But, uh, All right, well, uh, the final word, uh, we were talking about uh, communities and neighborhoods. You know, it just dawned on me that, you know, one of the reasons why people didn't have cars, again, when I was growing up, some had them, most of the families didn't, is because everything was in walking distance. Yes. Mm-hmm. I mean, my father would walk up to the corner bar. It was like a private little neighborhood club. Everybody knew one another. Right. Sure. In that same block, there was a grocery store, uh, dr- uh, dry cleaners. Uh, uh, your, your church was always within walking distance. Right. And even uh, firehouses, because yeah, horses right. couldn't run two miles to get to a fire. They yeah. were all within, what, about four or five blocks of each other? Yeah. And you often have little neighborhood department stores, right? Which might be equivalent yeah. of maybe two storefronts. Yeah, right. Yeah, no it's big box, you know, no shopping centers. Well, that's how yeah. Jewel started, like, like in Small. a storefront. Maybe yeah. it was yeah. fifty by one hundred fifty. Yeah, yeah. We had uh, our our neighborhood grocery store was a Kroger, right? Which is still in existence. They they call themselves, but the company Kroger, they 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 have different uh, name brands around the country, but right. Kroger is still. It's still big, and when I think back, you know, when you're young, everything looks so big. Mm. When I think back, that that Kroger store was no bigger than uh, yeah. the, mm. the 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 enter the entrance to a jewel mm. store. Was I, it Kroger that bought Mariano's? It could be. Ooh, yeah, I'm not sure about yeah. That. I, I know it's still. I th- yeah, I think it, so. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And then they had National and A and P. Yeah. Yeah. Dominic. Uh, Domin- well, Dominic, Dominic. Dominic. Yeah, that, right. w- that was yeah. kind of late, though. For yeah. Yeah. B- that started in Elmwood Park on North Avenue, and then yeah, on River right. Forest on North Avenue. That was one of their first big stores. Uh, it br- branched out. Oh, interesting. And they had a. It it was kind of unique, but when they first opened, they had like a. A a tower that the airport have, and they had some guy in there telling me with the the black Ford go another three spaces and you could pull right in and it didn't last very long but it was kind of neat okay we're in the uh home stretch here uh for this edition of that time uh, (laughs) how many dedicated no uh neighborhoods are there in chicago well the the woman that wrote that book uh she was supposed to be with us today but she's i guess she rescheduled for another time uh, I hope so. Yeah. Um, let me just assume uh, there are, are 77 official community areas in Chicago. And then there's I think l- roughly up. the same size and population, but a lot of the branch libraries now have uh, maps of neighborhoods oh. put out by the Chicago Association of Realtors, and there's more than 200 wow. neighborhoods on okay. this. So you have one official community area. Right. Then you have a lot more because a lot of these community areas might have several neighborhoods within it. Right. 
Right. That lady is very, very interesting. And I you're right, it was 77 uh, yeah. is in her book. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And how many were bought up in the annexation of the, what, the last 18... 90s or something? Well, 89 was the big annexation. Right. Because yeah. that's size, where yeah. we have a firehouse, or what used to be a firehouse on Lombard and Lake Street, and that was built by, uh, what's this township? Cicero oh, Township. Yeah, Cicero in 96 yeah. and 29, that's the only firehouse in the Chicago that wasn't built by the city, and it's still operating with the same... Engine companies. No. I think it's got a record for not moving the engine company and the truck around. Hmm. Mm. Well, Ken Little would know that. Sure. Yeah. yeah. Ken would, yeah. But I remember that because they had the Cicero Township uh, courthouse on the second floor. That was pretty neat. Hmm. Yeah, no, Nor Norridge and Harwood Heights are the only two cities that they didn't incorporate into Chicago. They're, they're both completely surrounded by the city of Chicago. Yeah. Wasn't there a thing hey, around? Emanuel should just take him over someday. Well, that's what he was talking about. He right. was talking about annexing some... I don't know what no towns it was, <laughs> but, I mean, it would be prohibitive now because the city's got to vote for it. They have to have a you know, where people vote for it, too. Right. And in the town that needs to be annexed has has to do the same thing, yeah, and it, right. they think it would well, be they impossible. Could, when, they, when they see how much the taxpayers see how much money they can save because they don't need their own police department, their, right. their own fire department, and their right. own school system. and Right. Lincolnwood uh, is, is a prime example of that. Right. Uh, we always, we, the Chicago Fire Department, always... Uh, uh, covered Lincolnwood, right? And and I was, you know, lucky enough that I was up there for a, a great many years. Right. And towards the end, there, Lincolnwood wanted to uh, get a fire department, right? And uh, they voted, and uh, bingo, they voted on it. And a good friend of mine, that was a politician up there, uh, was uh, uh, asked me about it, about how we how we uh, responded to Lincolnwood and so forth. And uh, and so they did. They took it away from Chicago. They built their own right. fire department. Yeah. And uh, now, and this is a few years ago, now they're all complaining. Right. They're all complaining. It costs yeah. too much. Uh, they're, uh, they were looking into the fire protection districts. And that's a can yeah. of worms because all these towns that want to go in there lose their control over the fire departments. And Actually, and it's, the a, department. it's an actual yeah. the mayors, The mayors of these uh, small towns, they use the police department as their own private little army. Well, that yeah. They don't want to relinquish any power. Right. And that's basically the same thing with the fire protection district. Okay, guys. Well, uh, this uh, wrapping it up here towards the end. Uh, okay. We wish to thank Kevin of Jack FM at WRHS 89.7 FM for broadcasting our shows over the Ridgewood Radio Network. Recordings of previous Meet the Chicago Historians programs are available for your listening pleasure via the Internet at www.windycityhometown.com. A special thanks to the executive producer of Windy City Hometown Radio Entertainment Network, John Seconda. On behalf of everyone associated with our Historians program, we thank you for listening. And uh, watch for us again next month, April. This is your announcer, Rich Lang. So long until next time. You have been listening to Me to Chicago Historians from the John DeVito Broadcast Center on the Windy City Hometown Entertainment Network on Monday, March the 19th, the year 2018. This broadcast was produced by Jack Ryan, directed by John DeVita, and our special thanks to the executive producer of Windy City Hometown Entertainment Network, Mr. John Chaconda. Until next time, friends, be safe and thanks for listening. <laughs>